Welcome to our guests and participants. Welcome po sa ating um, webinar for today. And I am Hannah Lynn Kapintin, and I will be your host for this morning. We thank you all for taking time to join us in this activity, the evaluation of watershed ecosystem services for policy. The Philippine and the Malaysian experience with the theme, FDC in 43rd years, linking science and policy. So since last year, FDC launched Forestry Policy eTalks webinar series that aim to inform and update its stakeholders and general public on the current policy issues and recent development in forestry, natural resources, and environment. Considering the importance of watershed in sustainable, sustaining various ecosystem, functioning and providing numerous benefits to communities, protecting the integrity of watershed is the primary concern. Thus, the FDC collaborated with the Forest Land Management Project of the DNR that aimed to disseminate the practice of sustainable watershed management and promotes its practice to a wide range of watershed stakeholders through the series of webinar through their Save Our Watershed campaign. And today, we are also glad that we have international and local participants all over the Philippines by a Zoom platform and FDC FB page by a live stream. To formally start our program, let us all bow our heads and feel the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ as we listen to the opening prayer to be followed by the national anthem. Dear God, Thank you for allowing us today to meet and share our knowledge and time with one another in this webinar. We are truly grateful for all the blessings you have bestowed upon us. May you extend your divine wisdom to our speaker so that he would be able to impart effectively his God-given knowledge to all of us. Bless the participants as well so that they would be able to glean the vital information from this activity and spread what we've learned in the spirit of your love and generosity. May we realize that this activity should glorify your name. Amen. Again, good morning to everyone and in ushering us to be settled in and gearing up for today, let us all listen to the welcome remarks by our dear Professor Marlo D. Mendoza, Dean of the College of Forestry and Natural Resources, UP Los Baños. Assistant Secretary Marshall C. Amaro, Jr. Dr. Jose B. Camacho, Jr., Chancellor uh, UPLD, uh, our two resource speakers, uh, Dr. Annalyn Pudilan, uh, Associate Professor, Institute of Renewable Natural Resources, and Associate Dean, UPLD CFNR, 
Dr. Shamsul Herman Dean Muhammad Apandi, Associate Professor, Department of Economics, School of Business and Economics, University, Putra, Malaysia. Our regional executive directors and other DNR officials, attendees from the Forest Management Bureau, Penros and Senros, Philippine Forestry Education Network Schools and other academic research institutions, colleagues, students, and guests, a pleasant good morning. Uh, my apologies, I forgot to uh, mention the designation of uh, my dear friend, Assistant Secretary Marshall C. Amaro. He's the DNR Assistant Secretary for Policy Planning and Foreign Assisted and Special Projects and Forest Management Bureau Director in concurrent capacity. Good morning, Asik Mars. Welcome to Forestry Development Center's Policy uh, E-Talks webinar series. No? Today's event is a special <clears throat> event because FBC is celebrating its founding anniversary. Let me congratulate FBC under the leadership of Dr. Priscilla Dolom on your 43rd founding anniversary. Also joining us are the former directors and staff of the center. A special and warm greeting to the former directors who have been trailblazers and indispensable part of SFDC's role. So namely Dr. Lucrecio Rebujo, Dr. Adolfo Redilia, Dr. Tony Balangue, Dr. Sinesio Mariano, attorney and Dr. Elena Peralta, Dr. Rex Victor Cruz, Dr. Renato Lapitan, and the late Anto Dr. Antonio Caranda. FDC is one of the units of the College of Forestry and Natural Resources, UPLB. It was created under presidential decree number 1559 signed into law on June 11, 1978. And it became operational on February 2, 2017. The mandate of the FDC is to conduct basic policy researches in forestry and develop or help develop an effective machinery for forestry policy formulation and implementation. To support its objectives, it has adopted the threefold approach of policy research, policy or bill review, and policy advocacy through seminars, forums and publications of the center's outputs. In the 43 years of FBC, it has conducted several 43 years of FBC, it has conducted several policy researcher researches and analysis geared towards providing information and recommend actions to enhance programs and policies in forestry and natural resources. The researches include topics on sustainable forest management, logging moratorium, community-based forestry, co-management, climate change and carbon studies, watershed management, reforestation, forest certification, among others. FBC's researches have led to the formulation of policies and administrative orders holding of forums and consultations with policymakers and concerned sectors, as well as participation in hearings and established partnerships with government agencies, private sectors, private sector, legislators, and other academic institutions. FDC has been particularly working very closely with the DNR offices, especially the Forest Management Bureau. The theme of this anniversary forum illustrates the important role of research in the development of policies and regulations and in support to evidence-based decision-making. 
We have two speakers who will present the result of their studies on ecosystem valuation conducted in the Philippines and Malaysia and the implications of the research on policy and decisions to improve the management of our watersheds and natural resources in order to sustain the ecosystem functions and services they provide. Again, welcome, and we enjoin you to actively participate in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Mendoza, for that heartwarming and endearing welcome for all of us. Now, to keep the ball rolling, for our opening remarks, may I call on Forrester Marshall C. Amaro Jr., CESO 3, Assistant Secretary for Policy, Planning, and Foreign Assisted and Special Projects of the DNR and Concurrent Director of Forest Management Bureau. Thank you, Madam MC. My uh, greetings to the uh, Chancellor of UP Los Banos, uh, Dr. Jose V. Camacho Jr., our Dean and a good friend, Professor Marlo uh, D. Mendoza of the UPLB College of Forestry and Natural Resources, the Director of the Forestry Development Center, Dr. Uh, Presi C. Dulom, and the uh, previous uh, directors who are joining us uh, in this uh, webinar series. Of course, uh, our speakers, we have Dr. Annalyn Kodilan from the UPLB CFNR Institute of Renewable Natural Resources and the Associate Dean, as well as a colleague from the University Putra Malaysia, Dr. Shamsul Herman bin Muhammad Afandi. Uh, everybody who uh, uh, joining us, I see 366 and now 367 warm bodies uh, at this point who uh, took time out uh, to be with us in this webinar series. Uh, my greetings to one and all from the DNR and from the Forest Management Bureau. First of all, let me greet uh, the Forestry Development Center. Uh, for its uh, 43 years of uh, very meaningful existence, uh, particularly in our sector and contributing very much to uh, 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 policy work of uh, not just forest resources, but uh, the environment and in general natural resources. So we'd like to you on behalf of uh, my organization to this uh, uh, webinar series titled uh, Linking Science Services for Policy, the Philippine and Malaysian Cases. This is the first uh, of five webinar series that uh, we have agreed to undertake in partnership with the Forestry Development Center and the UP Los Banos uh, Foundation Incorporated in line with our Save Our Watershed campaign, as earlier uh, mentioned. The campaign uh, uh, was initiated by the Forest Land Management Project, a JICA-assisted watershed rehabilitation project. And the campaign aims to encourage uh, various watershed stakeholders to take part and forge uh, formal declarations of support for collaborative watershed management and governance. This campaign was launched uh, by no less than our secretary, Secretary Roy A. Simatu, last 30th of July. And uh, the launch was attended by various stakeholders, uh, particularly national government agencies, local government units, civil society organizations, and business uh, sector, among others. I am uh, Happy to share this very important information that since it's launching, a number of private as well as government agencies already reached out to uh, FMB to signify their intention to join the campaign uh, and other relevant plans and programs of the DNR as far as watershed management is concerned. And as promised in the launching uh, activity, the Bureau has already uh, uh, completed 
the first draft of an executive order that will institutionalize sustainable and integrated management of the watersheds, including, uh, of course, the forests and biodiversity therein, uh, and guided by a holistic, collaborative, transparent, and science-based uh, gui guidelines or uh, guiding principles. So the draft uh, has been endorsed uh, yesterday to the office of uh, the secretary. And uh, uh, it is expected the development process in the DNR and eventually uh, hopefully find its uh, way to the office of the president for uh, consideration and for his approval. This webinar series uh, uh, will run until October, oh, November, sorry, 2021. And uh, lined up are the following topics. Uh, overview of watershed, revisiting the watershed concept and the current status of watersheds in the Philippines. Second is sustainable watershed management. Third, enhancing and sustaining stakeholders participation and watershed management. And fourth and last, uh, comprehensive approaches to watershed management planning. Uh, at this point, let me encourage everyone to, to actively participate in all these sessions, particularly for those who are uh, very much at the front lines in terms of our uh, uh, this particular mandate on sustainable watershed management. And uh, hopefully uh, participate very much in the uh, discussion and exchange of ideas particularly for those who have uh, very important inputs by way of sharing their experiences on the ground through the years, because I guess this concept is not new. Moreover, let me uh, inform that this webinar is uh, just one of the uh, many campaign activities that uh, uh, the program, uh, that of uh, the project rather, that of the uh, forest land management project, and of course, of the relevant projects being implemented by the DNR uh, with uh, the uh, technical inputs and guidance by, uh, guidance by the Forest Management Bureau to uh, raise awareness of the people about the importance of our watersheds. I am again uh, 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 encouraging everyone to uh, join these activities which uh, will be published and which uh, will be uh, even uh, aired in all the uh, uh, what, what we now consider social media, which I believe has become more effective, uh, and uh, also with our partners in this campaign and uh, even the regular networks. I uh, would also uh, be sharing with you that there are also provincial launchings of the Save Our Watershed campaign, uh, tree planting activities, and uh, uh, press releases, as I've already uh, discussed earlier. So you, you are therefore uh, invited to check with our Save Our Watershed uh, Facebook page for details and updates. Uh, finally, and uh, in closing, I, I wish for the success of this activity and uh, I am of the belief that uh, this is guaranteed even uh, as early as now because of the turnout. Uh, by this time, uh, we have increased to 400, over 400. Uh, and uh, I expect that uh, before we end uh, this uh, session, uh, there will be more joining us. Uh, so together, I, I believe that uh, this exchange idea and scaling up uh, of our good practices uh, would uh, redound, especially since uh, we have already recognized uh, the importance of watersheds, uh, especially for those our common uh, common uh, uh, common tao, as we call it. Uh, and like before, that this is a discussion only among peers, among colleagues, among those who share the same expertise. But because of this uh, campaign tagline, which was uh, 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 launched uh, as well by the secretary, that of saving watersheds is saving lives. I, I guess we have uh, made a lot of people aware that uh, it is now the time to look into these areas and uh, contribute. 
to their effective management because uh, by saving and properly managing these areas, uh, uh, this would be definitely impacting on our lives because uh, as the tagline says, uh, saving watersheds is saving lives. So I can only wish everyone a very successful activities in the Save Our Watershed campaign. Uh, again, my uh, uh, greetings to one and all, and uh, my uh, anniversary wish uh, for FDC to have uh, to be in existence for the same number of years uh, or even more, but definitely in different capacities in as much as we are moving very fast in our mandate, not just in forestry, but in governance of uh, all our natural resources. A pleasant day to all. Thank you and mabuhay. Thank you so much, Ase Camaro, for that very engaging message to open our activity for this morning. Now, let us all listen to the message of our beloved Chancellor of UP Los Baños, Dr. Jose B. Camacho, Jr. To College of Forestry and Natural Resources Dean Marlo Mendoza, to Forestry Development Center Director Dr. Priscilla Dolo, to the former directors of FDC who also held other important positions in CFNR and UPLB in the past, Dr. Juan Adolfo Revilla, Professor Emeritus Lucrecio Rebujo, Dr. Tony Balangue, Dr. Siniseo Mariano, Attorney Eleno Peralta, Dr. Renato Lapitan, and former UPLB Chancellor, Dr. Rex Victor Cruz. To our resource speakers, CFNR Associate Dean, Dr. Annalyn Kudilan, and Dr. Siamsul Herman Bin Muhammad Afandi, of University Putra, Malaysia. To all our guests and participants, the warmest of welcomes to you all. Congratulations to the Forestry Development Center on your 43rd founding anniversary. You have continuously fulfilled your mandate of conducting policy research in forestry for over four decades. I also applaud the recognition of the former FDC directors, their dedication and contribution to the center are worth celebrating. FDC's mandate is a reflection of UPLB's own desire to ensure that academic research and public policy go hand in hand. During these times of diminishing natural resources and vicious climate change consequences, research-backed policy pertaining to our forests and natural resources is critical in future-proofing them. In commemoration of this year's anniversary, this webinar titled Valuation of Watershed Ecosystem Services for Policy, the Philippine and Malaysian Cases, going with the FDC's theme of linking science and policy, is very timely. After all, one of the best uses of research is to serve as the basis for the creation of policy. In this case, policy that will be used for the sustainable use and preservation of the forests of two countries. To further talk about FDC's anniversary theme, I believe it to be important, not only in forestry, 
but as an element of policy making in general. Indeed, it is our responsibility as the National University to provide necessary research and scientific grounding with regards to the creation of laws and policies, whether national, regional, or municipal. Policy that is grounded in solid scientific evidence and research has the best chance of creating positive impact and growth. We have seen this happen on multiple levels, from small communities to local government units to entire countries. Speaking of which, I am also very pleased with FDC and CFNR's initiative of expanding policy discussions internationally through online means. The scope of environmental issues covers not just one country but many. The battle to preserve the forest from both destructive human activity and climate change consequences is one being fought all throughout Southeast Asia. I hope that CFNR will continue to pursue such international scale activities. Such cooperation and collaboration are vital for the future of our forest resources. With that, I enjoin all of today's webinar participants to really take this knowledge opportunity and make the most of it by actively listening to our esteemed speakers and participating in the open forum. Share your own experiences, know-how, and perspectives so that you will leave the workshop richer in knowledge than when you first arrive. Once more, congratulations to the Forestry Development Center on your 43rd anniversary. The UPLB administration will always fully support you in all your endeavors. Thank you, stay safe, and mabuhay tayong lahat. So now, let me show you a brief uh, flow of our program for this activity. Okay, so the, the activity for today, first part will be the FDC 43rd anniversary celebration program to be followed by our webinar with two speakers, Dr. Annalyn Cadillan of the UP Los Baños College of Forestry and Natural Resources and Dr. Shamsul Herman bin Muhammad Afandi of the School of Business and Economics from the University Putra, Malaysia. This will be followed by the Open Forum and Synthesis, and then the awarding of certificates, and then the closing remarks from our director, Priscilla C. DeLong. Now I would like to acknowledge again our sponsor for this activity, the Forestland Management Project Save Our Watershed Campaign of FMB, DNR, Sandro, Santa Cruz, and and Ecosystem Research Development Bureau of ERD or ERDB from the further siblings. Again, as mentioned by Ase Camaro, this is just the, the, the start or the first webinar series that will be hosted or sponsored by the Forest, Man Forest Land Management Project Save Our Watershed Campaign. And at present, our participant from the Zoom platform is around 427. And from FDC, FD Page Live is 68 participants. So these participants came from locally and international participants from different sectors of forestry, natural resources, and environment. So again, uh, let's all proceed to our FDC anniversary celebration. So let's all sit back for a while, enjoy, relax, and watch a short video presentation of the journey of FDC for its 43rd years in service together with our former directors.
responsive to local, national, and global concerns toward the attainment of sustainable forestry and natural resources. This is what we envision for the forest policies of our nation. And in 43 years, much has been planted and nurtured and much more work and toil to do in the field of forest policy. But for us to move forward and bring the lessons of the past to the future, let us also remember how much was sown. This is Forestry Development Center in 43 years. As we all know, the Forestry Development Center derives its mandate from Section 11 of Presidential Decree 1559. The pertinent portion of this section in the decree is given here under. There shall be established in the College of Forestry, University of the Philippines at Los Baños, in coordination with the Department of Natural Resources and the Wood Industries, a forestry development center which shall conduct basic policy researches in forestry and develop or help develop an effective machinery for forestry policy formulation and implementation. The decree was signed into law on June 11, 1978. Good governance is a necessary condition for sustainable forestry and natural resource management. An essential component of good governance is a relevant policy that is effectively implemented. In this light, the role of IFDC in policy development and policy advocacy as mandated in Presidential Decree 1559 can be easily and best appreciate it. It is truly because of the people before us that paved the way for FDC to continue to link science and policy in forestry. In celebration of more than four decades in serving the interest and welfare of the forestry sector, promoting human development, this is a glimpse of how FDC links science and policy through the stories and narration of our former directors. I was director in 1991-94. We did not have in our staff a PhD holder, but we had FDC fellows coming from the various units of the college and the university. But even with this, the FDC was lucky because it had very capable and dedicated staff to carry out its mandated function as a policy research institution serving the interest and welfare of the forestry sector and the Filipino people. The center also made use of its dedicated and capable staff in generating research projects that provided relevant scientific data and information, the bedrock of defensible policy recommendations, promoting of forestry and human development. Uh, we conducted uh, a number of monitoring and evaluation activities in selected CBFM projects, the outputs of which help in updating the implementing guidelines of the CBFM. The FDC also came out with a manual on forestry regulations uh, in close coordination with the FMB under the DNR. Among the important, uh, almost regular activities of this FDC at the time is the conduct of the National Sectoral Forum on Watershed Management. Uh, as early as during that period, they were able to develop a practical toolkit of problem uh, reviews, uh, project evaluation reviews. No? Yung for this, alam na alam nila, eh, yung tinatawag na diagnostic stage, no? identifying the problems of the policy, 
pagkatapos yung discovery stage where they uh, we were able to identify the problems of the users no tapos yung development stage translating uh, the ideas into uh, policies and services things, and the discovery stage and then communicating and uh, delivering the message to uh, the users no so we have that practical tool of coming up with a complete package of policy reviews I am aware that policy research in forestry and natural resources is expensive because of the need to gather data on the ground where most of the remaining management and operations are in remote places. Of course, secondary data may be used for trending type of policy research. Basing policy research using both secondary and primary data and information is important in order to get the attention and support of our policy makers. This contributions to the forestry sector are not possible without the assistance of various government and private agencies, non-government organizations, educational institutions, people's organizations, and other individuals whose lines of work are related to forestry, natural resources, and the environment. Thus, it is important to nurture these relationships for the center to fulfill its mandate. So much changes have occurred in the last 43 years. Changes in human, social, economic, and environmental forces, including forestry. These are expected. Thus, we have to continually grow and develop as a policy research team and institution. Review the law that created the Forestry Development Center and improve on this by expanding its mandates to include not only forestry policy studies, but also studies in the environment and natural resources. A provision for FDC support studies required by the government agencies who are implementing existing laws must be integrated into its revised mandates. A champion from the college or from the center should work on this with the lawmakers to ensure success. To enable FDC to make greater difference, first, be more concerted and massive policy advocacy drive through a stronger strategic alliance with the SFFI, Forestry Schools Alumni Associations, National Upland Development Council, Federation of CBFM Organizations, and all other stakeholders to put more pressure on Congress, particularly the Senate to approve Sustainable Forest Management Bill. And second, a more focused policy studies and advocacy aim at toppling down the formidable barriers to more effective implementation of priority policies and programs. I am very much aware of uh the long-term advocacy of a forestry development center to promote the sustainable forest management and in line with this you know to effect a change in the forestry code we really need to update you know to be able to uh, to uh, be relevant and responsive to the uh, to the current and emerging uh, uh, conditions and circumstances in uh, philippine forestry but having said that I am very sure that you will continue to be able to do your job considering that you have a full complement of a dedicated and committed uh, personnel. And I'm very sure also that your supporters, your partners, your, uh, uh, your colleagues in the college and in the university are, are uh, willing to continue to support you. And uh, you just have to continue to reach out to them and, uh, and mobilize them so that uh, you can uh, you can have additional 
manpower resources or human resources to be able to accomplish what uh, you're supposed to do. I just hope also that uh, I can continue to support you as well, you know, as you allow me to. And I'm, uh, you know, I'm always honored to be a part of FDC and all your uh, endeavors. You know, I congratulate you for uh, the past year and I am uh, happy that, uh, and I'm happy that uh, you are, you know, you are uh, still fruitful despite the uh, constraints of the pandemic, you know, and may it be that in the coming year that you will continue to be as productive, if not more productive and more successful in all that uh, you will embark on. So once again, Happy anniversary and uh, congratulations. My warmest congratulations. My congratulations. Glorious uh, 43rd uh, anniversary. 43rd founding anniversary. Special congratulations to the current uh, director, Dr. Priscilla Dulon. The unique position of the policy think tank of the college given that FDC is the only research center in the university that was mandated through a presidential decree, we recognize that there is a need to further develop as a research team and institution. Indeed, in a span of 43 years, much has been sown in forestry policy formulation, policy research, and in communicating research results through policy forum and publications, and much more still to be nurtured. At present, Dr. Priscilla C. Delom is the first woman and reps or research and extension and professional staff to ever head FDC and lead the center towards linking science and policy. 43 years and beyond, the Forestry Development Center is committed to harvest what was sown and nurtured and see that this policy development activities should create an impact in the forestry sector. This is how FDC links science and policy in forestry. I hope all of you enjoy the video presentation and learn more about Forestry Development Center through the years. So now for our next program, to give us a special anniversary message from our former director, let me call on Dr. Juan Adolfo Virivilla, who is one of the pioneer that conceptualized the creation and establishment of FDC together with, uh, with Forrester Leonardo Angeles of PWPA and Dean Romulo Del Castillo of College of Forestry. He served as the longest director of FDC from 1981 to 1989. His expertise includes forest resource management, forest policy and strategic planning, water-based sustainable development, and forestry system, among others. One of the more memorable experience that he had is he was concurrently heading FDC at the same time the Dean of the College of Forestry. Ladies and gentlemen, let's all listen to Dr. Juan Adolfo Villarreal. Have a great day, everyone. Let me start by extending my best wishes to all members, past and present, of the FDC family, directors, consultants, development fellows, policy researchers, technical staff, support personnel, and FDC friends. We all have played different roles in making FDC relevant during the last 43 years. And I am happy to know that the family continues to stay together even after 
they have departed or left the Sangha. If I were to make an educated guess, the idea of having at this year gathered momentum in 1976-1977 during the time of Dean Romulo A. Del Castillo. I seem to remember Dean Del Castillo, Forrester Dean, Dean Angeles, and Forrester Oscar Pendrano, and a few other alumni talking about it casually during the 1977 UPCF alumni homecoming. What major events happened at that time, Dean Rebullo is in a good position to tell us about Operation Insertion through Billiard and Bukopai diplomacy. Based on the above, I have no hesitation in naming the father others of FDC in the persons of Dean Romano, Edel Castillo, and Dean Lucrecio L. Rebullo with DNR under Secretary Hanolo as the good and willing accomplice. When compared with other UP strategic and policy study centers, the FDC was created by law in 1978, while the other UP strategic and policy study centers were established by the Board of Regents. The UP Center for Strategic and Development Studies in 1985 so that was seven years later in FDC. It's now, it has now become UP uh, Center for Integrative and Development Studies. And the UPLB CPDS in the 80s, 1980s. Now, the Center for Strategic Planning and Policy Studies based at SIPA. <clears throat> Let me dwell on the early years of FDC. From the top of my head, I may summarize the early years, specifically 1981 to 1989 as follows. <clears throat> FDC had a meager initial budget of 3 million pesos. It's for bu building, salaries, equipment, supplies, and other operating expenses. The approved personnel personal items included 17 technical staff, 12 administrative and support staff, including two drivers, but no budget for a vehicle. UPLB Foundation provided budget for one car, and as far as I can remember, we got a budget for another car the following year. I have no problem characterizing the early years as difficult, busy, challenging, enjoyable, productive, very good, very good rapport, relationship with coach stakeholders, staff, and the public. I had direct side door access to DNR top brands, other DNR officials, and leaders of the forest space industry. We had weekly and as needed meetings with them. FDC was conducting policy workshops and other related activities. FDC had the services of senior top CF top faculty, including CF department chair persons, as well as top UPLB faculty like Dr. Helia Castillo and Dr. Johnny Hamias, who, who were in openly impressed and repeatedly expressed their enjoyment, enthusiasm, and satisfaction in working with the FDC task forces on real world issues and problems. Initially, FDC was suitably organized into four task forces for optimal flexibility and efficiency. The task forces were Social and Environmental Task Force, Education and Training Task Force, Industrial Forestry Task Force, and the Forestry of the Future Task Force. The major outputs include a policy and program agenda for the natural resources sector, a 1,000 plus page report submitted to President Cory Aquino 
Pero, then, he and our secretary of Torah in 1987. 120 experts, specialists, representing all fields related to forestry, other natural resources, and the environment, including legal, social, and media experts, volunteered their services. The Ford Foundation, through the intercession of Dindel Castillo, voluntarily gave, without our asking, 1 million pesos as support for the private project, while FDC and NRMC acted as secretariat to provide technical and other support. Item 2. Various policy workshops and reports, <clears throat> including the creation of FRDC, the Forest Free Resources Development Corporation, and the Wood Industry Industries Development Corporation. Unfortunately, these two agencies were later managed for purposes other than what they were intended for. Third group of outputs. Various policy papers for more effective management and conservation of forest resources and other natural resources and the environment. Four, quick response, emergency forestry, natural resource, environment policy workshops to address the immediate and urgent needs of the DNR and the forest based industries. <clears throat> FDC conducted quite a number of these three day and night quick response workshops for the DNR and PWPA. Finally, I am most thankful for this opportunity to participate in FDC's 43rd founding anniversary. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Juan Adolfo Villarevilla for his message. And may we request all our former directors to kindly open your video. And so now let me call on our director, Dr. Priscilla Cido Long for the awarding of our plaques of appreciation. Dr. Dolong, please unmute yourself. Okay. Okay na po. Okay. Yes, tita. Good morning, everyone. Let me specifically express our gratitude to our former directors, Dr. Lucrecio Ribuyo, Dr. Juan Adolfo Ribilla Jr., Dr. Tony Barangue, Dr. Sinesio Mariano, Dr. Rex Victor Cruz, Dr. Attorney Erino Paralta, Dr. Renato Ripitan, and the late Dr. Tony Carandang. For their dedication, encouragement, support, and contribution to the Policy Development Center. We are grateful for their continued effort to nurture, train, train and develop the FDC staff to fulfill our mandates as a party research and policy advocacy center. For the past 43 years, the former FDC directors have always participated in our activities and helped us in realizing our mission and goals. They have always been generous with their expertise and knowledge in policy research, analysis, and formulation in the field of forestry, environment, and natural resources. This is why, as part of the celebrations of the FDC's 43rd anniversary, we would like to acknowledge our former directors 
and present to them this plaque of appreciation. Please allow me to read and award it to our former directors. This plaque of appreciation is awarded to our former director in recognition of his wavering support, commitment, and contributions as director of the center from the period of appointment as director. Given this fourth day of August 2021 during the 43rd FBC anniversary celebration, signed uh, Professor Marlo D. Mendoza, CFNR Dean, and Priscilla Dolom, Director at PC. Thank you. Okay, so may I request all our former directors, as well as uh, Ase Camaro and Dean Mendoza, to open your video, as well as uh, former John Pulihin to open our, your video for the photo opportunity or photo session. Okay. So let me are all the directors and the and all the other panelists kindly open. But let me count to one to three so that we'll be able to take picture. Okay. Everybody. Let's open our video for the photo. Okay. So let's count. One, two, three for the picture. Okay, ready? So let's count. One, two, three, smile. Okay. Last one. Another picture. Okay, one, two, three, smile. Okay, thank you so much to our panelists, our guests, especially our former directors. Thank you for your contribution, your guidance and support in molding the FDC staff all these years. So again, thank you so much, Po. And now let me turn over uh, to you, our Game Master, for the next activity. Go, Jor and Oliver. Take it away. Thank you, Ate Hana. So, good morning po sa lahat. Thank you, Ma'am Presi, and to our former FDC directors. So, I hope everyone was able to watch and listen to the audio-visual presentation played earlier because now we are on the part of the program wherein we will be having a mini trivia game about FDC in 43 years. So, but before we proceed, let me introduce myself first. So I am Jorella Garcia, and with me is Mr. Oliver Marasigan, and we will be your game masters for this morning. So for the mechanics of the game, we will be flashing three trivia questions on your screens. So later, we will explain the prize mechanics after the trivia game. So um, for our first question, Oliver, can you share? Paul? So for the first question, the, fir uh, the first person to type in the correct answer in the chat box for our Zoom participants will receive a prize. So, but you can only answer or type in your answers after Oliver finishes reading the question box. Okay, so Oliver, can you read the question? Okay, for, the, for our first question, FDC is the only policy research center in the university that was mandated through what presidential degree? Okay. After I count one to three, pwede na po tayo mag-type ng question natin, ah, ng answer natin in the chat box. One, okay. two, three, go. Okay, Dr. Team, can you help us track kung sino po yung ating first na sumago? Wait po. So may nakakuha na po ng correct answer. So can we flash po yung correct answer? Okay, let us see. Wait lang po. Dr. Team, can you help us po kung sino yung... Can you send? Okay. 
Sultan Mabudong. So, wait. Sobrang dami yung sumagot po. So, wait na. <laughs> What is yung name ng Manalo? Wait lang po. So, yung, for our first question po, the first one to get the correct answer po is Sir Edward Dum Dumrique. Okay po. So, put note na lang po. Then, for our next, so congratulations, Sir Edward. So, for our second question, uh, the fifth person to type in the correct answer in the chat box for Zoom participants also will receive a prize. So, okay, Oliver, second question po. For our second question, the FDC was mandated to conduct what kind of research? A, basic policy research in forestry, sustainable forestry research, forest management research, or social forestry research. Okay. <laughs> Dr. T. Wait lang po. So, okay. So, may nakatama na rin po ulit. Uh, Can you help us track po kung sino? <laughs> Wait po. Okay, our, yung winner po for our second question is Miss Karen Sotomango. I hope I'm pronouncing it right po. So let's proceed po to our third question. So for our last trivia question for this morning, uh, uh, reminder lang po af uh, after po magbasahin ni Oliver yung questions, tsaka lang po tayo mag-type in ng answer para po matrack natin kung sino po yung winner. So for the third question, the seventh, seventh person to type in the correct answer for uh, sa ating Zoom chat box will also receive a prize. So let's go, Oliver. For our third question, what did the FDC become? When did the FDC become operational? Ready? One, two, three, go. Okay. Okay, so our correct answer po is Mary na ring nakakuha. Oliver. <laughs> wait, wait. Wait lang po ah. What? Tinitingnan po pa po ng ating doc team kung sino ang seven na nanalo. Okay. Wait lang po. Masyado pong maraming... <laughs> Okay, so our seventh or our third winner for our trivia game is Miss Robillet. Rob okay po, inote na lang po ng ating doggy game. So thank you po sa lahat po ng nag-participate sa ating mini trivia game for this morning. So congratulations po to all the winners. And uh, for all the winners... We, we have a very special prize for all of you all. So as part of the FDC anniversary celebration, the FDC staff will plant indigenous fruit trees to be named after you, after the winners. The very environment friendly for our adding prizes. So one of our staff will contact you regarding the details that will be placed in the seedling to be planted. We will also ask you for your email addresses so we can send you pictures or updates of the planted indigenous which is in your name. And so thank you very much po to everyone. So also to our participants, there will be a raffle draw later. So you have to stay tuned until the end of the program. Thank you po. 
So now let me call on Dr. Len Bugayong to introduce our next guest speakers. Thank you. Thank you and congratulations to the Forestry Development Center. Um, magandang umaga, salamat pagi, um, Aron Sawad, mabuhay sa inyong lahat. Good morning everyone from Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, and other places uh, where we have uh, participants today. Uh, welcome to the FDC's 43rd anniversary policy webinar with the team um, valuation of watershed ecosystem services for policy focusing on the Philippine and Malaysian context. Yes, the FDC is going global. And as our Chancellor Camacho mentioned earlier, we are opening our policy discussions to the international community. So while we were in the process of preparing for this anniversary webinar, we thought of inviting our friends from other countries to share information about linking science with policy in their respective countries. So this is the first of our uh, in globalization of the FDC policy e-talks. So initially, we designed the uh, forum, the webinar, to highlight valuation of ecosystem services as a policy decision tool for managing forests and watersheds in the two countries. Um, during the preparation process, as mentioned by ASEC Marshall, the FNB's Forest Land Management Program agreed to co-sponsor our watershed webinar series as part of the DNR Save Our Watersheds campaign. And the, the topic for this day is the first of the webinar, watershed webinar series. So uh, regarding our two papers, the Philippine paper will be uh, discussing the valuation of four ecosystem services in the watershed sites of the FNP, while the Malaysian case is on the valuation of ecosystem services provided by their natural recreation sites outside the watershed. I will now introduce our two paper presenters, and then we will listen to both presentations before the open forum. So please uh, type in your questions in the Q&A box of Zoom or the comment section of Facebook, and we will read them uh, during the open forum. Our first speaker is a graduate of the Bachelor of Science in Forestry, magna cum laude, of the UPLB College of Forestry and Natural Resources, where she also obtained her Master of Science degree in Forestry before proceeding to take up her PhD from the University of Tokyo in Japan. She is currently an associate professor at the Institute of Renewable Natural Resources of the college, and her fields of expertise are on natural resources assessment, forest biometry, and forestry economics. And she has published a number of scientific papers in local and international just journals, and as well is involved in several research and development projects in these fields. She served as the project leader in the FDC's project on valuation of ecosystem services in the forest land management project sites, which was funded by the FNB, uh, FNP project. Just this year, she was uh, given the position of Associate Dean of the UPLB College of Forestry and Natural Resources. Our first speaker is no other than Dr. Annalyn L. Codilan. Our second speaker has degrees in Bachelor of Science in Forestry, major in Recreation and Park Management from the University of Putra, Malaysia in Serdang, Malaysia. He also has a Master of Science in Wildlife Management and PhD in Recreation and Natural Resources Economic Valuation. He has published over 45 articles in local and international journals and authored four books and was involved in 22 research projects while leading 12 projects related to economic valuation, tourism, and natural resources. Prior to his current job, he worked at the Forest Research Institute of Malaysia, or FRIM, and at a private firm. 
He also served as head of the Department of Recreation and Ecotourism at the Faculty of Forestry at UPM. At present, he is an associate professor at the Department of Economics at the School of Business and Economics in UPM. Just a brief trivia, our uh, second speaker is no stranger to us because he has visited the UPLB campus sometime in 2000 when he was a research grantee of the Apafri Three Link Research Program, along with uh, 30 other graduate students from the University Putra Malaysia, Kasetsart University in Thailand, and our own UPLB, where our director, Dr. Presi Dolom, and myself and some other members of the faculty, Dr. June Tiburan and Dr. Um, uh, Galang were also grantees. So our second uh, speaker is none other than Dr. Shamsul Herman B. Muhammad Afandi. So ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, let us now listen to the rec recorded presentations of our two speakers, but they will be with us live during the open forum. Good morning, everyone. Today, I'll be sharing about the policy implications of valuing watershed ecosystem services in forest land management project sites in the Philippines. This is actually an offshoot of a six-month project between FMT of DNR and the Forest Forestry Development Center of the CFNR UPLB. By the way, FMT is a DNR project in partnership with JICA, which started in 2012 and is about to be completed next year in 2022. It aims to strengthen forest land management by integrating conservation and development activities in collaboration with local communities and other stakeholders. Our original project with them is entitled Valuation of Watershed Ecosystem Services in FMT Sites. And this project was born out of the fact that we know that watersheds, if properly managed, will, um, can provide various goods and services for human welfare. Watershed ecosystems can yield the flow of services that are vital to humanity like provisioning services, regulating services, supporting services, and cultural services. The critical watersheds um, serving as FMP sites like the Upper Magat and Kagen River Basin, Upper Pampanga River Basin, and Halaur River Basin are not exempt from these services. Now, the ability of these watersheds to provide ecosystem services is very much affected by their structure, complex relationship between um, their biological and physical components, and existing land use and land cover. Despite of the importance of ecosystem services from watersheds and the dependence of humans on their provision, ecosystem services continue to be undervalued, especially in the critical watersheds under FMP. Past experiences show that undervaluing of ecosystem services or the connotation that they are free lead to unsustainable resource and environmental degradation. Thus, this, was, this project was implemented. So for today, I will be sharing some of our results, but more focus will be given on the policy implications and recommendations. Okay, so the Forest Land Management Project, or FMP, um, is implemented in four regions, you know, in CAR, Regions 2, 3, and 6, and covers about um, 25 sub-watersheds in all. So you can see in the slide the location and the names of these um, sub-watersheds. And this is the project framework that we followed. And in line with the objectives of the project, activities such as rapid assessment, stakeholder analysis, and valuation study were conducted to characterize the watershed sites, identify who are the stakeholders, determine the ecosystem services from the perspective of the stakeholders and the decision makers, estimate the value of the identified ecosystem services and impacts of current and future management options to these values. And lastly, identify the most appropriate scheme for a possible PES program in each site. Due to the nature of the project, the results are limited to estimating values of ecosystem services for baselining purposes. The results were estimated using science-based models with appropriate assumptions and adequate data input. Now, most of the data used are limited to secondary data, 
gathered and verified from the field. Primary data gathering is limited to the conduct of personal surveys, focus group discussions, and key informant interviews. Um, based on our data gathering activities, we were given a long list of ecosystem services that the various stakeholders think are provided uh, to them by the wa subwatersheds they are in. The list was finalized and streamlined until we were able to come up um, with a final list of ecosystem services to be valued for each region. So as you can see from the table, across all four regions, water services, soil erosion control, and carbon storage and sequestration capacity of the watershed were identified as major ecosystem services that should be valued. Uh, we can see that stakeholders put premium to the capacity of the FMP covered watersheds to provide them with water, not only for domestic purposes, but also for um, other uses like industrial irrigation and hydropower uses. Moreover, stakeholders also recognize the importance of the watershed's good forest cover in providing them with soil erosion control functions. And similarly, stakeholders express the importance of knowing the value of the carbon storage and sequestration services of the forest inside the watershed. On top of these services, recreation services will also be valued in CAR to determine the value of maintaining the woodlots or muyong in the continuous provision of recreation and aesthetics. On the other hand, biodiversity conservation functions will be valued for region two, three, and six. For the three common um, watershed services that were valued for all FMP covered sub watersheds like water, carbon, and soil erosion, the integrated valuation of ecosystem services and trade offs or invest tool was used. And in order to complete the valuation scenario, a cost based approach was used in combination with the invest tool for water supply service. The output of this includes um, a maps and values for the an annual average water yield available for different uses as affected by climate and land uses. Also the economic value of water provision services for different uses. For carbon, the outputs include maps showing the average carbon storage capacity by land use type in the different management scenarios and the economic value of carbon sequestered based on the social cost of carbon. So social cost of carbon is equivalent to the avoided damage generated if the same amount of carbon um, were released into the atmosphere. For soil erosion, the replacement cost method was used in combination with invest tool. The outputs include maps and biophysical values showing the average soil loss by land use type in the different management scenarios and the economic value of soil loss based on the market value of soil nutrients loss like NPK. Data gathering for these three ecosystem services includes focus group discussions and key informant interviews to supplement the data requirements of the invest tool. Okay. Now, the value of recreation in car and biodiversity conservation in regions 2, 3, and 6 were measured through willingness to pay of the contingent valuation method. For recreation, tourists were interviewed to determine their willingness to pay for the conservation of woodlots in relation to the continuous provision of recreation and aesthetics in the Ifugawa Rice Terraces. On the other hand, for biodiversity conservation, the households was um, interviewed. The households were interviewed for their willingness to pay for the conservation and management of the protected area or sub watershed in relation to the continuous protection of unique flora and fauna in the sites. Okay. Um, in addition, in addition to this, for the valuation of water supply, carbon storage and sequestration, and soil erosion, two base periods we have. 2018 to 2022 as the current time period and 2023 to 2027 as the projected time period. And two scenarios um, were used. Now, so the base periods were already mentioned, while the scenarios are business as usual and development scenarios. So under the business as usual scenario for the base period 2018 to 2022, information from DNR like the 2010 and 2015 land cover map, LGU land use map, and identified activities in the river basin project were all considered to form the current um, BAU scenario land use map. This map reflects the current land use without FMP interventions or basically without the project activities. 
On the other hand, the same information and in maps were used to generate the current development scenario land use map. This map shows the same current land uses as the 2018-2022 BAU scenario, but with the addition of FMP intervention. So now with the project. Um, this generated scenarios assume that under business as usual situation or without the FMP, interventions to increase forest cover inside the sub watersheds would be limited and forest degradation in the future may be expected. Forest degradation would then lead to a decline in the capacity of watersheds to provide ecosystem services, hence the probable decline in the value of ecosystem services. On the other hand, under the development scenario or with FMP, interventions to increase forest cover may increase the capacity of watersheds to deliver ecosystem services using, of course, BAU values as a baseline. In some cases, the value of ecosystem services under the development scenario may remain constant or there would be no change or may also decline, but not as much as the decline assumed under the BAU scenario. For the future scenario 2023 or 2027, so this is the time that the project is already completed, the same information on land uses were used with the addition of priority land use indicated by the different stakeholders during the FGD. Using the mean ranking given by the stakeholders, the top priority land use was identified for each sub-watershed. And using the invest scenario generator, the 2023-2027 land use for each sub-watershed um, were generated using the identified priority land use and the average annual land use change from 2010 to 2015 as the basis for the total area of expansion. Now, the grasslands and the open and barren lands were assumed to be convertible land uses in the projection, while we also um, impose appropriate land use restrictions. The land use layers were then intersected with the sub-watershed boundary layers using GIS to calculate the area of each land use class per sub-watershed. Now, for the prioritization, we can see that um, in some regions, various stakeholders prioritize forest lands among other land uses. This may indicate that stakeholders in these areas um, see the premium in maintaining forest lands as their major land use. However, it's also evident that in some regions, a shift to agricultural land use is a priority among stakeholders. So now let's look at the um, current and projected land use under the two scenarios. So um, in this analysis, um, that uh, land use, the major land use for CAR in Region 2 under the current period 2018 to 2022 is forest. On the other hand, the major land use for Regions 3 and 6 are grassland and agriculture, respectively. Under the projected time frame, or 2023 to 2027, major land use for car in Region 2 remain the same, so it's still forest. And Region 3 changed from grassland to forest, while the major land use for Region 6 remain to be agriculture. Under the development scenario, there's a noticeable increase in forest and agroforestry areas for car, Regions 2 and 6. For Region 6, uh, sorry, regions, uh, car, Regions 2 and 3. For Region 6, there's a similar increase in agroforestry areas. However, we can see that forest areas in the region decline. Results of land use analysis for Region 6 shows that there is a relatively large agricultural area to begin with that even with FMP interventions, no, these were not enough to significantly decrease these areas and transform them into areas with improved vegetative cover. Now let's go to the um, some results of the estimation of the ecosystem services. So for water, uh, we saw a generally decreasing trend in the estimated annual water yield per sub-watershed uh, observed both for BAU and development scenarios. This is probably because for all regions, the rainfall amount from 2020 to 2027, so the data that we have gathered, is projected to decrease. The, uh, thus, the projected annual rainfall for the future yields is also decreasing. So this resulted in a similar decrease in water yield. Under the BAU scenario, the total annual water yield for the eight-year period is approximately 17 billion cubic meters. The following um, sub-watersheds are the major contributors. So we have Upper Ibolao in CAR, Bukig in Region 2, Pinagloriahan in Region 3, and Suage Magapa in Region 6. On the other hand, 
under the development scenario, the total annual water yield um, during the same period is approximately 18 billion cubic meters. And the major contributors are the same watersheds we identified in the BAU scenario. Now, comparing the water yield under the two scenarios um, revealed that for CAR Region 2 and 3, the total annual water yield values under the development scenario are generally higher than the annual water yield estimated under the BAU scenario. In this case, um, in the case of Region 6, the development scenario is lower than the water yield under the BAU scenario. And then similar to the trend observing the biophysical amount of water, <clears throat> the net present value of water for domestic and industrial use is also decreasing over the years. The total net present value of water yield in all regions uh, during the same period is higher in a development scenario, which is about 110.8 billion pesos than the BAU scenario, which is 109.1 billion pesos. Now, in terms of carbon storage and sequestration, carbon storage for um, the current time frame, you know, FMP subwatersheds approximately stores about 29,700 carbon tons under the BAU scenario, with the highest amount observed in Region 2. On the other hand, carbon storage under development scenario is about 24,200 carbon tons, which is lower than the BAU estimates. Similar to the BAU scenario, the highest carbon storage under the development scenario is also in Region 2. No significant changes in values were observed in 2027 estimates. And for 2027, the total carbon storage values are 29,800 carbon tons and 24,200 carbon tons under BAU and development scenarios, respectively. Under the BAU scenario, the total sequestered carbon between 2022 and 2027 is about 129.69 carbon tons per year. On the other hand, about 175.48 carbon tons per year of sequestered carbon is observed under the development scenario. And for all regions, there is a net gain in carbon sequestration between 2022 and 2027 due to the increase in carbon storage. Again, the difference in carbon storage values is affected by the carbon stock estimates and consequently the change in land use. The total estimated cost of carbon sequestered um, during the same period using the social cost of carbon dioxide and as a discount rate of 3% is approximately 33.3 .3 million pesos and 45.1 million pesos for BAU and development scenarios respectively. These values um, also indicate the amount of damage that is averted because of maintaining a favorable land, um, land cover. For CAR regions 2 and 3, the present value under the development scenario is higher than the BAU scenario. In the case of region 6, the present value under the development scenario is slightly lower than the BAU scenario. Now for soil erosion control, which is measured in annual soil loss in INVEST, there is an observed decreasing trend in the estimated annual soil loss per sub-watershed under BAU and development scenarios. The difference in the annual soil loss values from 2020 to 2027 is mainly due to the projected rainfall amount each year. Under the BAU scenario, the total amount um, the total annual soil loss for the eight-year period is approximately 13.1 million tons with the following major contributors. So we have Alimit West subwatershed in CAR, Bukig in Region 2, Pinagloriahan in Region 6, and Swag Swage Magapa in region, in region 6. The highest annual soil loss was observed from Region 2, which is about 5.2 million tons. And under the development scenario, the total annual soil loss during the same period is approximately 11.6 million tons with the following major contributors. So we have Upper Ibulao in CAR, Bukig in Region 2, Jaman in Region 3, and Swagi Magapa in Region 6. Total annual soil loss values under the BAU scenario are slightly higher than the annual soil loss values under the development um, scenario, especially for CAR regions 2 and 3. This means that the FMP-related projects and interventions implemented in these regions may have positive impacts in reducing soil erosion. 
In terms of economic value, there is an increasing trend in the, in the undiscounted value and present value of annual soil loss per sub-watershed, which is due to the increasing prices of, of NPK complete fertilizer each year. Uh, these economic values under the BAU scenario is generally higher than the values from development scenario for car regions two and three. And overall, the difference between the two scenarios is about 73 million pesos, indicating um, that the projects and interventions of FMP can be expected to reduce soil loss from 2020 to 2027 with a corresponding economic value of 73 million pesos. Okay. Now, for biodiversity conservation, which we um, estimated for regions 2, 3, and 6, the public expressed their willingness to pay for the conservation of biodiversity in protected areas in the FMT water, sub-watersheds. The highest mean WTP amount was observed in region 3, which is about 359.58 pesos per month, followed by region 6, and the least is in region 2. These values translate to a potential annual collection per household of about 2,040 pesos in Region 2, 4,212 in Region 3, and 3,913 in Region 6. So for Region 2, the average annual revenue amounts to about 7.02 million pesos with total present value of revenues to be collected from 2020 to 2027, reaching an estimated value of 33.98 million pesos. In the case of Region 3, average annual collection could reach up to 32.63 million pesos, and the present value is about 157.69 million pesos. For Region 6, annual revenue collection could reach about 76.63 million pesos, with the present value of about 370.77 million pesos. These potential revenues can be used to fund the projects and activities of a biodiversity conservation program that will be designed to manage and conserve the unique flora and fauna inside the FMT sub-watersheds. Moreover, these values can also be used to estimate the value of biodiversity conservation services provided by the FMT sub-watersheds. Finally, for recreation, the tourists visiting Ifugaurais terraces express their willingness to pay for the protection and conservation of the woodlots in the sub-watersheds <clears throat> to maintain the aesthetic beauty of the rice terraces. Tourists were willing to pay about 296.67 pesos per visit and on top of their visit-related expenses to conserve the woodlots and maintain the scenic beauty and of the rice terraces. Respondents indicated that they are uh, also willing to pay for such amount in the form of an environmental fee. The total present value of all revenues from the potential collection of the WTP amount from tourists from 2020 to 2027 is approximately 136.39 million pesos. <clears throat> Now, um, the study determined the value of major ecosystem services being delivered by the FMT sub-watersheds in CAR regions 2, 3, and 6. And results show that careful land use interventions contributing to the overall health and structure of the sub-watersheds positively affect the sub-watersheds capacity to deliver ecosystem services. In addition to these findings, the study, um, the study recommends the following operational and policy recommendations to further enhance the capacity of FMT sub-watersheds to provide valuable ecosystem services. So let's start with water. We recommend to implement more development activities such as reforestation, agroforestry, soil and water conservation, and forest protection. In addition, harmonization of programs, projects, and policies across various authorities and, and agencies concerned in the, in the sub-watersheds will, will also greatly help. Uh, we also recommend establishing a network of rank of gauging stations in important watersheds like the FMP sub-watersheds study so that time series water yield database can be established. And lastly, spatial analysis using GIS technology may also be considered to identify vulnerable areas and where to properly install um, soil and water conservation measures. So for carbon storage and sequestration, we recommend incorporating development projects and the LGU reforestation activities or projects and plants in the FMP sub-watersheds. They could also allot a portion of their era to fund such development projects or explore other sources of funds such as private companies 
corporate social responsibility funds, civil society reforestation projects, bilateral and multilateral grants, and other development um, government development funds. For soil erosion, we recommend increasing forest cover through reforestation activities and forest protection. At the same time, addressing the socioeconomic needs of forest-dependent communities through sustainable livelihood and capacity, capa capa capability building. Uh, we also recommend developing grasslands and brushland shrubland areas to improve vegetative cover while existing closed and open forests must be strictly protected from degradation. Um, implement more soil stabilization measures and soil erosion control measures, especially in areas heavily prone to erosion, and proper land use zoning must be implemented and used in updating the FLUP. And lastly, for biodiversity conservation and recreation, we recommend developing an appropriate fee collection mechanism and identify the institutional framework for fund handling and management. So it could be a watershed management council or the LGU itself or PAMB. Now the program that will, fund, that will be funded should include at the very least biodiversity resources assessment and monitoring, cap capacity building and IEC. Um, if ever there would be fees and rates that will be collected, it should be reviewed every five years and programs like adopt a sub-watershed or a portion of the sub-watershed may also be offered to private companies or non-government entities. Uh, we also recommend strict monitoring and fund management, especially for the ECOGO Resources by the Office of the Municipal Tourism, and cre creating a five-year tourism development plan, which will outline the activities that could be funded by the uh, fees collected, and implement a unified and appropriate scheme to collect the environmental or entrance fees from all tourists. The results of this, so as for the general policy recommendations, um, the results of this valuation study may be used in crafting the phase out activities of the FMP project, which will be completed next year. And the result of the valuation project should be communicated or used as a reference by the LGUs and other concerned stakeholders in determining the value of ecosystem services identified and incorporate it in updating their CLUPs, FLUPs, or their ads DPP. In addition, it is recommended that these results uh, may be integrated in various plans, such as watershed management framework plans, um, integrated watershed management plans, river basin management and development master plans, and protected area management plans. Updated plans and its efficient implementation allow the watershed to sustainably provide their provisioning, regulating cultural and support services. And plans based on updated data and information are a good source of reference for determining the value of goods and services provided by the watersheds. Further, it is strongly recommended that a master plan be crafted to harmonize various plans from different agencies and authorities operating inside the sub-watersheds. Likewise, any development projects from other government agencies like NIA, DPAH, and DA, and private sectors like water districts and NGOs, whether inside or outside the FMP site, should be in harmony with the master plan. These development activities are not standalone and such will have an impact on the whole river basin. And on the other hand, activities in the other sub-watersheds outside the FMP site shall likewise have an impact on the overall ecosystem. It is therefore very important that such activities are integrated into all levels of management units. And uh, we also recommend that planning activities be inclusive and participatory to ensure that IPs, local communities, and relevant stakeholders are represented. It is also important that proper zoning of forests and appropriate land uses are identified to ensure that forest ecosystem services are protected in the long term. Further, transparency and accountability should guide the implementation of such harmonized plans and policies by the various institutions, agencies, and sectors. We highly recommend and support the formation of a watershed management council, maybe at the province level, or a multi-sectoral local body for the management of the watershed and must be established through a local ordinance. The council will be responsible for the conservation 
um, development, protection, and utiliz utilization of the FMT uh, watershed and the rest of the watershed in the province. The council shall initiate programs, projects on developmental activities like reforestation and capacity building and trainings. Um, we also recommend conducting further studies on the valuation of identified ecosystem services in the subwatersheds that we studied and also in other subwatersheds in the province to supplement the results of the study. This could serve as a basis for the development of a policy framework for payments for ecosystem services or PES or PES like schemes that can be adopted by the LGU, especially in areas providing PES in the FMP project sites. Um, lastly, the valuation study is a significant input in the formulation of a national guideline for the implementation of PES in the country that could be developed by DENR through, a, through an administrative order. The, the said DAO may be elevated later on into a presidential executive order to cover payment of ecosystem services in the country that could also be implemented by other agencies, not just by DNR. Site-specific PES mechanisms may be adopted through resolutions or ordinances by the LGUs or other multi-sectoral bodies such as the Watershed Management Councils or Protected Area Management Boards. So currently, there is no explicit policy that adopts PES, which is envisioned to enhance ecosystem conservation and development through payment schemes in utilizing the goods and services derived from the watersheds. Um, PES is largely dependent on a reliable and accurate um, economic valuation of these goods and services. Economic valuation, however, in our country is not yet fully institutionalized and there is no standard, no valuation method for um, environmental services. It is therefore imperative that a policy framework should be crafted to institutionalize PES. And if that framework will be institutionalized, um, the following aspects must be considered. So there should be a well-defined good or service of an ecosystem categorized into different categories, prescribed valuation methods based on the um, categories above, and a protocol and evaluation method um, should be given or standardized the accounting of nat natural resources clearly defined buyer and seller of the good or service and clear identification of their roles, especially the different stakeholders and intermediaries and the real beneficiaries. What is the payment mechanism and fund management scheme? What is the scheme for IEC and monitoring and evaluation system? And support for continuing R&D on economic valuation of studies and PES to keep abreast with all the development and techniques in natural resource accounting and valuation. Now, under this concept, there must at least be one buyer and at least one seller, and under the condition that the buyer um, only pay if the pays if the provider continues to deliver the defined ecosystem service over time. Thus, it becomes very necessary that the buyers and sellers of environmental services are properly identified. Appropriate tools in undertaking this requirement must be employed with the requirement that there's a wide participation of relevant stakeholders. And as there is a need for the seller, who is usually the POs managing the watershed, to continuously provide the services being sold, these sellers must acquire the needed skills to continuously and effectively manage the resource so that there is a continuous production of these services. This can be done by providing them with training and other capacity building activities. It is also very important that their confidence as effective watershed managers be improved. <clears throat> Excuse me. For, as for the conclusion, the results of this study show that the value, biophysical and economic value of FMP subwatersheds in terms of delivering various ecosystem services such as water, carbon storage and sequestration, soil erosion control, and biodiversity conservation and recreation. The presence of FMP and its initiatives is important in maintaining the, and enhancing the delivery of these ecosystem services in the future. In general, the capacity of FMP subwatersheds to deliver ecosystem services um, depend, no, depend on the existing, depends on the existing land use. And um, the values and estimates reported in the study give resource users, managers, and policymakers an idea of the value 
of the watershed ecosystem. And knowing the value is one step in keeping these ecosystems and resources from being abused and mismanaged. Finally, policy recommendations must be carefully examined, especially for the formulation of the national guidelines and implementation of PES in the Philippines. So that's all for my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. And I also want to thank the FDC family for um, this opportunity to work on this project. Thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the Forestry Development Center, University of Philippines, Los Banos, for giving me an opportunity for this FDC 43rd anniversary policy seminar. I'm honored to be part of this great occasion. Perhaps it is not too late to congratulate Hidalin Dias for her gold medal to the Philippines in the Olympic recently. I'm Dr. Shamsul Herman from University of Putra, Malaysia. For this talk, I'm honored sharing uh, some of our works in regards to payment for ecosystem services for recreational and tourism in forests in Malaysia. I'd like to start by sharing some of uh, forestry facts and figures of Malaysia. Okay, uh, generally, we have uh, West Malaysia with 11 states and East Malaysia, two states. The Malaysian government comprises of three levels one federal government, 14 state governments, and local authorities within these states. In forestry, we have the Forestry Department of Peninsular Malaysia and federal government. There are also state forestry departments in all 14 states. The Forestry Department of Peninsular Malaysia, FDSM, in short, regulates the policies for forestry in Peninsular Malaysia. Meanwhile, all administrations, operations, harvesting, licensing, tourism management, and all day-to-day -day duties are performed by the individual state forestry departments. Okay, here's some facts and figures on forestry in Malaysia. Right, in Peninsula Malaysia, there are approximately 5.7 million hectares of forested land. And of this size, there, there are 4.81 million of uh, permanent reserve forests. Well, the management of forestry lies under individual states in Malaysia. However, we have one forestry policy for the whole nation. The provision of this policy comes from the clause two of the Article 72 of the Federal Constitution. Well, the National Forestry Policy was approved by the National Forestry Council and endorsed by the National Land Council in 1978 and then revised in 1992. The main objective is to conserve and manage the forest through sustainable management and maintain its uh, important roles in the national economy and preservation of environmental stability. In overall, the policy outlined many aspects of forestry in Malaysia. This and the following slides and this, uh, the objectives of the national policy. As you can see on the screen, these are among the objectives of the national forest policy. All right, I, can, I like to highlight that this uh, four, this number one here, permanent forest estate, uh, protection forest, protection forest, Amenity forest and recreation and education forest. You can see there, I, I, it's in red in color. And uh, community forest, recreation and tourism here in, in this uh, another uh, objective. Right, in policy number one, just now, that I have shown just now, the policy elaborates further by stating that the permanent forest estate are to be managed and classified under four major functions, right? And the first one is the protection forest, right? This is for ensuring favorable climatic and physical conditions of the country, safeguarding of water resources, soil fertility, environmental quality, 
preservation of biological diversity and the minimization of damage floods and also erosion to rivers and agricultural land secondly is the production forest all form of forest produced within the country and are required for agricultural domestic industrial purpose and export the third one the amenity forest okay it is one it is for the conservation of adequate forest areas for recreation to ecotourism and public awareness in forestry this is where our project was addressing the policy the last one is for research and education this is for the conduct of research education and conservation of biological diversity we should understand that there are areas dedicated for recreation and there are also areas for other important physical functions such as watershed in practice the state forestry departments have dedicated forest land for all four outlined under the nfp there are permanent forest reserves especially for water catchments where no development took place in those areas there are also forest reserves for sustainable forest management timber productions educational forest for teaching and r and d for example upm educational forest known as sultan idris sharafuddin forestry education center is an education forest which was like an agreement with the state uh, slango state forestry department we use this forest for our forestry program and for other related educational activities and the amenity forest now branded as forest eco park is one of the major services provided by the state forest department the forestry department now is promoting on a holistic approach of call what is called by forest beyond timber where the products of forests are now emphasizing on ecosystem services rather than relying on tangible products okay in accordance with the nfp and forest beyond timber the forest eco park serves the public for its services in recreational and ecotourism purposes among popular activities are picnic river bathing jungle trekking organized camps and mountain climbing and many more however the activities are only limited to non extractive recreation hunting wildlife trapping forest product gathering are not allowed at the moment there are 128 forest eco parks and forest state parks in peninsula malaysia for the year 2019 these are the list of those uh, amenity forests you can see every state uh, every state we have uh, 11 in peninsula malaysia so every state have those um, taman eco rimba or, or, or forest eco parks right you can see these are the names these are actually the names of those location yeah right uh, you can see uh, the red in color you see they are this uh, in font color in red uh, are the locations that we did the study you're okay, moving on i'd like to share some of our work in doing a study on payment for ecosystem services especially proposing the feasibility of having a pes in forest eco parks Okay, there are three locations. There was uh, uh, Chemurung, Chemurung is the name, yeah? Chemurung Forest Eco Park, Sungai Troy Forest Eco Park, Ulukenas Forest Eco Park. So these three locations are located in Peninsula Malaysia, right? You can see uh, the state of Kedah, Sungai Troy on the topmost is, uh, is uh, in the state of Kedah where it is, um, the state is bordering to Thailand. And then uh, this is an area where the forest eco park is located on a mountain uh, where the product was uh, scenery and cool weather, so which means people go there for this scenery and cool weather, approximately 800 meters above sea level. And then the second one is Ulukenas Eco Park, state of Perak. This is a lowland forest where the activity is uh, river bathing, picnics, camps, because they have facilities over there. And this is quite popular and quite nice. Um, um, a river uh, where you have this recreational facilities. And then Chemurong Eco Park, uh, that is in the state of Trangano on the east coast of Peninsula Malaysia, where it is also a lowland forest. Uh, 
and what is um, nice about this place is of its waterfall, approximately 300 meters above sea levels, but one of the tallest waterfall in peninsula and popular for picnic. And one of the uniqueness is that it's also a popular place for mountaineering. They, they have like three days, two nights um, mountain, mountaineering activity. Right, let me move on. Um, okay, this is how it looked like this in Chamorong, right? Where they have this mount, uh, the waterfall. So you can see hikers and then they have this um, uh, mountain guides. If you want to climb the mountains, you have to hire the mountain guides. It's uh, some kind of an agreement with the mountain guides. And these mountain guides are actually the locals, trained local with license to go and bring these uh, uh, tourists to go and climb mountain. Right. Uh, another one is Sungai Troy. This is in uh, Kedah, uh, in northern part of Peninsula just now. Uh, you can see in the in the picture, uh, you can see the lowland where they planted paddy. Right. Those are actually paddy fields uh, in the in, in you know in the northern parts of Peninsula Malaysia is popular. It's known for paddy fields. Right. Uh, sad thing about this part, place is that it's experiencing uh, vandalism. So we need to have um, hypothetical contingent evaluation method when we did the study All right and then this is Ulukanas quite well maintained and then they have um, uh, chalet facilities like the one you can see on the screen that is the uh, A-shaped uh, chalet and then they have camping site and then they have this um, uh, a hall for the, for the activity and then you see my main activity like this boy jumping off rocks to the to the river right so they come with families and this is more towards camping and uh, um, picnicking activity. All right. So, uh, how that we how did we conduct the study? Right. Um, we have a framework. Right. This is the framework that we have adopted. Actually, when we study PES, it's actually a combination of different disciplines. It's not just economy. You have to know the science as well. You need to know the economy, and also you have to know some kind of um, uh, uh, agreement or law. Right. So, but in our study, we are actually in the first part. We we are concentrating in the first part, not on the implementing, but more towards uh, conducting a study for feasibility and how the PS can be uh, adopted when it is uh, when it is agreeable with all the stakeholders. Okay, you can see here the product that the ecosystem services that we concentrated on was ecotourism or recreation. So you can see. First part was uh, flora and fauna inventory, P1 and P2. What is that? That is actually to know what's inside your area, your place. You need to know what is there, what are the um, sensitive uh, plants, you know, uh, endemic plants maybe, right? So we need to know that. You need to know what's in your house. It's like your, your hotel. You need to know what's, how many rooms you have, how many you have buggies, you have, you know, pools, things like that. So you need to know that. And then P3, if you look on the, in the middle part of the screen, uh, we need to know how much of this area, what is the value, what is the tree value, what is the animal value, what is the wildlife value. Maybe they are um, endemic or maybe uh, uh, endangered. So you need to know that. And you need to know in terms of economic value because you need to compare. Right? So that's why you need to know the evaluation. So we did that also as well. But it's, it's by my team, it's not, not just me, there's uh, several team members to help me to, to do this, all these studies. And then, and then look at P4 and P5. P4 and P5 is actually to understand the capacity because we do not want to have this ecotourism to be over tourism. We don't want that to be destroying the area. So you need to know, is that area capable of having, what is the amount? What is the amount of people that are allowed to be there? Right, so you need to know that. And importance performance analysis is where you, you evaluate uh, um, the quality of recreation, recreational experience that you, the area can give. You need to know because when you sell something, you need to know the quality. So this is a quality when we, when we go for recreation. These are uh, the measurement that you can use to, to measure what, are, what, is, what is happening on the area. Right, and then P7 is the economic evaluation. I think uh, you understand that. Yeah, where we conduct a few, uh, we have, I will explain in the next slide, uh, where here we need to determine the, the price of natural resources use, right? And then from there, 
we need to know the entrance fee. So from there, we can estimate what is the entrance fee, All right? So, and then the PES uh, mechanism in P8. So the PES will be depending on the location because at different states, different forestry department, they have different uh, management style. And although we have an, uh, a single policy, but when it comes to implementation, it's up to the uh, state forestry. So uh, we have to some kind of like tailor-made how the PS mechanism depends on the locations. And then down there, we have a GIS study that's, that's to support us in, in having the, uh, a plan so we know the layout of the area. All right. So in our PES ecotourism mechanism in P8, eh, if you look at the 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 okay this side, if you look at that that uh, uh, number is P8 there. Eh? So PES ecotourism mechanism, we did uh, conduct contingent valuation method CVM and also choice experiment to understand to get information from tourists. Eh, these are the stakeholders. Uh, look, local communities, right? Uh, local businesses and mountain guides. So we need to know uh, what is actually their their uh, the, the what they call the willingness to pay for entrance for entrance fee, right? And from there we determine the entrance fee and also to determine the economic value for the recreational use, right? Uh, after that we had focus group discussion, uh, several series of them, because we have three locations and then we have. Um, one location we have more than one, so uh, we what the things happen during the uh, GD among the, the big uh, agenda or things that we need to achieve was to verify the entrance fee. After the CVM study, we, had, we obtained the C, uh, the entrance fee, the willingness to pay for entrance fee, and then from there we verify with the group, and then also after that we need to determine the PES mechanism. How is it? how is the money is going to be distributed back to the location. And, uh, and also the intention was to have a trust fund for the, the location, all right? Okay, these are when we had the, the, the FGDs. All right, so among the consensus when we obtained during the FGD uh, was, uh, as I mentioned just now, to open a BES trust fund and jointly manage, right? Um, that's one. Second one is to deposit the payment to existing district forestry department account, right? Uh, and from there, uh, you need to get consent from the committee for expenditure. So you need to form a committee. And another uh, option was to have a cooperative for eco forest, but this one, uh, but this one, we don't really go deep. Uh, we uh, most of the FGD session uh, more uh, more towards on having a trust fund. Right, so this is how, this is the proposed PES mechanism when we did the study. So buyer is tourist, right? Buyer is a tourist, right? So mechanism is paying tickets. So they pay tickets to enter the park for recreational purpose, right? So the tickets will, will give some kind of uh, revenue to the state. So this money will go to uh, uh, an account Forest Management Trust account, right? So this account to be financed for ecotourism cost. Right? So this ecotourism cost, what is ecotourism cost? Ecotourism cost uh, comprises of two parts. One is one of one of it is ecotourism management cost. Right? Anything related to provide management uh, to to provide ecotourism. Uh, maybe manpower, maybe programs, maybe facilities, right, to, to, to support ecotourism activities. And apart from that, you need also conservation and public awareness so that people will understand why we need to conserve this area, why we need to uh, cap the cleanliness, why we need to make sure this place is good so that when they understand, then people, tourists will come. When tourists will come, they will get some kind of benefit, maybe some kind of business, maybe they, they you know, they, they have, opportunity to, to run some business for tourism, right? So these are among the tourist, tourism costs. So this money cannot be used for other things. You can only use for this so-called ecotourism cost. And, um, and this state forestry department to look after the tourism cost. And also one thing is that you need, when we sell as a seller, you must be able to make sure the quality is of your product 
in this case is ecotourism experiences. So from that sense, we need they need to have what we call a service evaluation, a scheduled uh, tourist survey. So we need to know what is happening, uh, what does the tourist think, what are the things that they need, or maybe they need to upgrade things. So this is where they get information. So it could be done from self-evaluation, right? I mean, the department can go and make uh, have some kind of self-evaluation and also from coming from tourists or from a uh, working paper, right? So this is where the trust administration will endorse. Right? You have to have an administration committee to endorse the forest management trust account so that it can be used to finance that ecotourism cost, right? So this is how what we, we, we um, proposed to the, um, to the owner or to the seller of uh, uh, well, forest eco parks, I'm sorry. All right, so from that, we have um, uh, a concept what we call as five C's, five C's, yeah? So uh, in order for, for, for a place or for, uh, for eco park or for recreation activity, when they want to have a PES program, implemented. These are the five things, five C's that they need to be considered, they need to consider, they need to be confirmed. First is conservation. Why? Because conservation is where the products comes from, right? The only um, way for them to get the uh, recreational experience, you need to have trees, you have to have anim uh, animals, you have to have wildlife interaction of that. And this can only be achieved if you have conservation. Right, and from there, you need to also provide conducive and quality recreational experience. It's not just like dull, you have to have programs, or maybe, depends on the objective, whether it's nature tourism, uh, adventure tourism, or any kind of maybe uh, indigenous tourism, but, but all related under ecotourism. So you need to have a conducive and quality recreational experience. Of course, clean, it's well, it's straightforward known, we have to be clean, right? So this is also issue in, in forest eco parks. We have this problem of vandalism and cleanliness is always an issue, right? Comfort, of course, we need to have comfort, right? When it's clean, you need also to have comfort facilities up to the standard for kids, for adults, for maybe for, for uh, elderly. And then safety, say, when we say comprehensive safety, which means it's not just the safety of your life or the tourist life, but also it's safety of the belongings of these tourists and safety of the uh, properties of the parks, safety of the staff, the personnel that runs after the park. So safety, comprehensive safety. So these are among the five C's that we proposed that before in order for, for a PS to take place, to be, uh, to be implemented, you need to consider these all five C's, all right? So how to do that is that, um, uh, you have, uh, we have to have a monitoring reporting system, right? So you need to monitor the area. You need to know what is there from time to time, time, and then it needs to be reported, right? And then from there, we can propose have, of having an accreditation of these parks. At the moment, there is no like hotel, you know, like hotel, they have um, star rating. So just like that something like that. So we, we have that so that you will be able to maintain the quality of recreational experience for visitors when they pay, right? Right, so here, um, monitoring can be coming from interactive media. And now, now we know everything, everyone reports to social media. So some of it can be used, Facebook, Twitter, so comments and suggestions might come from there. For the younger generation, even even older generation, we are now using all this social media, social media. You need to have uh, public relation officers, right? We need to understand. So we need to have could be rangers, could be a, a, a PR a person, and it's also coming from tourist feedbacks from time to time, surveys and all, and uh, reporting, right? Now we almost all department will have annual report for for this PES. We need to have a specialized PES annual report. What is happening? What have you done? Right? What are the activities related to PES, giving out uh, uh, recreational activities? And also, because it involves money, then you have to appear to have a PES annual financial report. 
So we have annual report and then we need to have PAS annual financial report, right? The last one is PAS verification report. I have to go to the last part, accreditations. So accreditation where we need to have auditors to come inspect the locations, right? So we need to have documents revision and you have to have failed visits to look whether how is the safety, how is the comfort, how is all those five C's that I've mentioned earlier. So this is from when, when, when they have come to a level, to a, uh, to a certain level, then they can be certified. So when they have certification, this can be imputed into PES verification report. All this is for recreational and ecotourism services of the locations. Yeah? All right, so now, the way forward, what we have done, uh, um, all right, con uh, the first one is uh, looking into constitutional and law studies, right? <clears throat> In the law, we, we, uh, there is, we don't have the, the uh, what they call ecosystem services to be charged for ecosystem services. So we still, uh, we need to, 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 what they call, amend the law so that ecosystem services is chargeable according to law. So it's still a long way, but uh, it, it's, it is ongoing, right? So that we can bring it to parliament, we can bring it to parliament so that we have power, so that to, to, to be able to have a uh, power source for ecosystem services, right? And then uh, in our part, uh, UPM part, uh, we have more, more collaboration now with the state forest departments. Uh, previously, we had pro, uh, working with uh, the federal level, but now we are going into state level because the state level are the one who actually, <clears throat> actually own the place. They are the one, the implementer, the one who looks after these eco parks, right? So we need to have more collaboration with them and it seems that we have that uh, ongoing, right? Uh, second one is that, the third one is incorporating uh, economic valuation into other application studies, right? Now, <clears throat> um, Previously, economic valuation, economic valuation for non-market goods uh, are not really popular in, 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 in decision making. So now we can see that uh, it has been used, especially now last two years, last years we had uh, a study on con best, uh, sorry, uh, cost benefit analysis for ecological corridors. So where we, we used, or we incorporate economic valuation into that in estimating the benefit of having an ecological corridors, the intangible benefit. <clears throat> All right. Uh, the economic valuation was also uh, used in uh, in in, in valuate, valuing the compensation for land conversion for public infrastructure. We had you know this uh, MRT daily train going into uh, uh, urban forest, right? So how to how to to get the comp com uh, what do you call it? compensation? Then it is uh, it is, was based on economic valuation. We did uh, there was a study on that. And uh, lately, the forest department are looking into forest beyond timber, so which means it's an alternative consumptive, non-consumptive income from forestry. So it's also a, uh, going to be a way for economic valuation. All right, I'd like to thank you for your, uh, for your time listening to my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to our speakers, Dr. Annalyn and Dr. Shamsul. Uh, may we request you to open your cameras for the open forum. And uh, everyone, let's give a warm round of virtual applause to our speakers for the concise and very informative paper presentations. And Dr. Shamsul, thank you for the congratulate, congratulatory greetings to the Philippines' first gold medalist in the Tokyo Olympics. We are also grateful for the Malaysian people who took care of Ms. Heideline Diaz during her training in Malaysia prior to her competing in the Tokyo Olympics. Again, thank you very much. So um, before we take on the many questions, <laughs> 
uh, we would like to acknowledge our former FDC colleagues, both retired and uh, who have moved on to other offices. And particularly, I'd like to um, acknowledge Dr. Mirna Karandang. Uh, she is, she's the wife of our director, Antonio Karandang, who passed away. And uh, Dr. Mirna also started her career at the Forestry Development Center. Welcome po sa inyo. Okay, um, to both speakers, again, we'd like to um, remind our participants that you can type in your questions in the Q&A box and the comment section of FDC uh, Facebook page. And we will try to read through some of the questions. We know we have limited time. So um, please also indicate your email address. So we will forward the questions to our speakers and they will address them through email. So firstly, um, to both speakers, the results of your evaluation study um, were forwarded to both the DNR in the Philippines and the State Forestry Department in Malaysia. And one of the questions by our participants is whether there have been positive results from these agencies in considering them in policy development for PES. So who would like to answer first? Ladies first. Okay. Doc <laughs> <laughs> Annalyn. <laughs> Okay, so um, for that question, as um, uh, sorry for the technical issues um, regarding my presentation, but in one of my slides, I showed the project framework, and um, in, in one of our activities, we presented our results to the regional uh, level and at the national level, uh, the at the FMB, and uh, I also I also mentioned in my presentation that the Actually, the objective of the pro of the evaluation project is to really come up with a baseline data on the values of the ecosystem services that uh, watershed um, provides. So uh, when we presented this to DNR, uh, I think we had a, a good reception of our results, and they also wanted that um, our results be included in the draft. Um, I think they have a draft on. Um, it's a draft admin order or something like that on PES. So I, I, the results of our study are being considered um, to be included in the in the draft PES mechanism that they are um, doing. Okay, thank you. Doc Shamsul? All right. Uh, uh, salamat po okay, for the question. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, yeah. Um, what can, what can sh uh, share? I think this is, this is the question that I think is going to be very Number one question: Has it been has it been implemented, right? So, um, in our project, we present we presented to the state forestry department, right? So this is the agency who works for the state government. So we have state government. So uh, even at state, we have like um, uh, not not parliament, but just a parliament for the legislative body for the, the the state. So they have to bring this matter to the state government, right? We presented the study, so they use the study to present to the state government and. It's only the state government debate in in the uh, there is uh, parliament state parliament then they come up with the uh, uh, rules or law lah. Um, but uh, this study is quite recent about two years three years ago i don't really like to say this but you know that in malaysia our political situation was not it's like uh, it's like olympic <laughs> you know uh, even uh, even until Last, last night they had uh, quite quite um, heavy the, the the politics. So I think um, they they still have um, um, you know because we have reshuffling of governments. So um, so that's where we our, our situation. So but the thing the good thing is that uh, the forestry department is looking into this uh, non market valuation. They 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 uh, they open their mind. So they think uh, this uh, can be used uh, in the uh, managing of this forest. And for the start, actually, they have four, four targets, um, carbon, uh, eco ecotourism, uh, water, and uh, the other one I forgot already. So there are four. So, but uh, mine is uh, towards ecotourism. So uh, yeah, I think I agree with that. So there are some of the questions, uh, whether it is uh, can be implemented, something like that. And Dr. Anna, yeah, I 
think uh, you and I, we are having the same uh, situation. We propose yeah. to the government, but uh, the, the problem is now we, it's beyond our hands. Uh, yeah, they, they, the one who have to, to, to implement uh, actually the one who have the, that power. Uh, so our part is just trying to do the study and supply the information. Yes, we agree very much. The FDC has been advocating for so many uh, policy recommendations and we continue to advocate for them. We understand your situation also that uh, it's really difficult to uh, influence or uh, push for policy reforms among, among our political um, officials and officials. So some of the questions, um, I think one of the questions for Doc Anna, uh, we have generated uh, 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 ecosystem service values through our studies. So uh, the question is, what goes uh, on? What? How do we move forward when we have um, generated these values? I think uh, as I understand, uh, those who will be implementing the PES mechanism will not take these values as it is. So please explain the, how it's going to be used in actual PES mechanism development. Yeah, so, yeah. so actually I, I read some of the questions regarding that. Um, if, um, yeah, so as explained, as explained in the presentation, so our task in the project is to really come up um, with an estimate of the value of the of the watershed ecosystem services because right now uh, we don't have any instrumentation or don't have any idea what is the value of these ecosystem services. And as explained by Dr. Shamsul and very clearly in his presentation, there are various steps in instituting a PES scheme. And right now, um, the, the recommendations in our project are still recommendations and uh, a PES scheme has not been implemented in any of the areas because uh, the only thing that we did is to uh, prove that there is value to these ecosystem services. So this is just a baseline uh, data. This is just a baseline value. But uh, towards instituting the PES, there are still relevant steps that should be followed. Um, like for example, the values that we came up with in our study, they should be um, verified still uh, through proper instrumentation and data and analysis. And um, as I've also discussed in one of my last slides, the requirements of the PS framework, like uh, the, the buyer and the seller should be properly identified, uh, what is the specific ecosystem service to be valued and all other steps. So. Uh, we are still at the beginning, at the beginning step of instituting PES in any sites in the Philippines or in the site FMP sites that we studied. So, but I, but I think that's still um, great progress because we have um, um, initiated the steps. But as for the formal institution of PES, I think it's it's in the hands of uh, of DNR uh, to to have a national policy regarding that. Yeah, thank you. The discussions for the policy on PES started way, way back. And then um, sometimes when, with the changes of leadership in DNR, uh, some things are highlighted while some things are uh, shelved. So this is uh, the mechanism, the best mechanism has been, um, uh, has resurfaced in the previous years. So there's another question for Dr. Shamsul. Uh, in your PS mechanism, are locals or stakeholders, do, they, do the locals or stakeholders have a share from the fund generated from ecotourism tickets as not all locals can just establish their own business or not everyone can be a local guide? So how about those who will not be directly in, engaged in tourism activities, but also play the role, uh, contribute to the scenic beauty of the area? Relative to this, under the seller in your proposed best mechanism in conservation and public awareness cost, does this include benefits given to stakeholders who play the role in conserving the recreational areas? Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, okay. I think I understand now. Uh, I saw the question also, but he yes, mentioned yes, okay. yeah, so maintaining the rice fields. All right. So I think the issue here is that um, uh, in our study, 
uh, this area, this forest area is uh, some sort of like a gazetted area. Uh, it belongs to the forestry department. It's a, a forest reserve. So which means uh, we can say that the area is actually the land under the forestry department. So we can say that the uh, everything is being managed or, or, or the sole uh, provider is the forestry department, right? But um, uh, and then, then we say the stakeholder, maybe the stakeholder, uh, yeah, in, it's, it's still in the beginning part, you know? Um, we, we don't, in our study, we don't really have a stakeholder like the local communities uh, into getting the, the fund in, 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 in managing the area. Unless uh, if they are uh, related to the, Place maybe they work there or they have business there. So, but in this this one is I think this is the first PES study conducted. <laughs> so the Philippines are more advanced in, in, in conducting PES studies, All right? So I mean the first in forestry, right? But they have in, in other areas. But uh, so but if you have like a party field, then then you don't have like a boundary. Right, so everybody will have because they, they have the area. So I think the, the situation that the challenges is that to me lah, is is the, the boundary. So you, you have to identify which actually the, the stakeholder. Uh, if you really want to have them to get the benefit from the, that fund, then you have to have a clear stakeholder. Uh, how is that? But in our case, we have that boundary, so we can have that the forestry department, right? And uh, um, yes, and, uh, yeah. yeah, I think I answer answering both question, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, there's also from our friend Dr. Pat, uh, Professor Pat Malabrigo. Uh, he hi, Pat. mentioned hi, uh, yeah, the highlight of the, uh, I, I think you mentioned something about inventory of the biodiversity resources. So I think we're also doing that in the Philippines, but maybe yeah. you can just share about this in Malaysia. Okay, uh, when we did the study, uh, we, are, we were also required to conduct an inventory. So we adopted uh, what we call as a 3F inventory. Uh, inventory. Uh, it's 50 by 50 plot, I think. I'm not really an expert at, at this, uh, but uh, it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, um, it's a standard procedure for SFM, Sustainable Forest Management. So they have this pre inventory and we have plots, uh, sampling plots. Uh, I think it's like, I don't remember, I think 10% or 10% 10, 10 of the total area. So we need to know, it's just like your, your you know, let's say you have, uh, uh, my example just now was a hotel. You need to know what's inside because recreation is actually, what is the product? It's the experience. People don't go, people go to the beach because they go to uh, Boracay because of the, the, the uh, beach. You go to the forest because of the forest. So the forest, you need to know what's inside the forest, inventory for flora and fauna. So uh, uh, we use the standard measure. They, they use uh, the, the, the standard method in, in, uh, in inventory for pre-felling. So uh, somehow we get some idea what are the species inside uh, and, uh, the, and then also the uh, wildlife. But the important thing is that we have to know whether they are endemic species or endangered species so that these recreational activities won't disturb them. And that, that's why you also have a, GI, a GIS mapping. So these yeah. are the areas that you should avoid. You know, you have to have zoning for this. Uh, um, very uh, uh, fragile uh, species. Uh, sorry, Dr. Len, I saw one question. He asked think, from Mr. Roy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he, uh, uh, I'd like to help him with the study. I propose for him to conduct a CBA study, cost-benefit analysis. So you would know what are the costs, you will know what are the benefits. So the cost will be in terms of variable cost and fixed cost, and the benefit will be in terms of uh, intangible benefit and tangible benefit. Then from there you can decide whether it's worth to have that the project. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Shamsul, for Annalyn. Um, Dr. Annalyn from Cell Director Celso Diaz. Uh, he says that since your valuation results are only partial economic valuation, what other types of researches are needed to arrive at the estimated total economic value of watershed ecosystem services? Gandang question. <laughs> Yeah, uh, sir. Thank you for for that um for that question. Um, uh, this is this is the output of our study. Um, given the limited time and of course the budget that we are given, and of course the specifications that uh, were given to us by our by the bit by the by FMP. But um, if we are going for total economic value, then there would be a lot of things that uh 
that should be done. So first and foremost, um, there should be data because that is that is the problem, number one problem that we had when we started with the project. But we have really have no data, primary data regarding water, soil, carbon, and we had to work with secondary data, secondary data for that. So I believe that should be the first thing that uh, should be worked on when um, other research studies on valuation will be done on the same areas that we study. That's going to be a lot of work, I think. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, another question. Um, uh -huh. I think you've covered a lot of in your presentations already, and some of the questions here are just clarifications regarding the results or the conduct of the study in the results. Um, um, do you have anything else to share about uh, how your studies has um, impact on the policy decision making in your countries? So that's the main question. The theme of our webinar is linking science and policy. So as uh, closing uh, remarks, <laughs> can you tell us more about what you think, uh, sh how, what should be done in order to strengthen the linkage between science and policy in both your, uh, our countries? Okay, ladies or gentlemen first? <laughs> Go first, Dr. Shamsul. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, now it's my turn. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Um, what can I say? I think, um, yeah, I agree with uh, Dr. Lan, uh, especially uh, we, we are scientists, right? So, policymakers are the policies, the policymakers, lah, politicians. <laughs> so, um, uh, we, we, we should use our knowledge in science to, to help nature, lah, to help the mother nature, right? So to have a more sustainable way of um, utilizing them, right? Um, but here in my presentation, um, we our challenges uh, is that in our law, because you see uh, our law is quite um, um, long. <laughs> uh, started like uh, it started when when the British colonized Malaysia. At that time, we don't have Malaysia, so the law was from that era. So at that time, the uh, the the forest the forest area are only for production, so mainly for timber lah, and the product so mainly for timber. So at that time when we the the national acta forest acta pertanian uh, forest act uh, um, was the form, we don't have that ecosystem services in that law, so you don't have power source. So the, the forest department does not have any power to charge for ecosystem services. So, so you know, uh, you can argue when you charge them. People can argue when you charge them because there is nothing in the law says that you can charge us if you want to use. Uh, so, but they have other ways of, of charging entrance fee. And it's very minimal. It's one ringgit. One ringgit is like 11 pesos per entry. All right. So now, um, now they, they are doing that. They try to do that so that we have ecosystem services in the law so that you can use that as the basis for, for any kind of charges. All right. So when you have that, then when it's law, then you have to do it, right? You have to 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 implement it, right? When you have when you have that law, you know, the clause in the law. So so that's one way, lah. Uh, right. So that's how. Uh, I, I I like to share also uh, some departments like uh, now I am in UPM. We are in the Sl uh, Selangor State. Selangor is in the middle where we have Kuala Lumpur, the capital of the country, uh, in the middle of state of Selangor. So it's quite uh, quite um, quite advanced the state. Uh, in term, in term uh, uh, relative to other states, so it's quite uh, even the COVID cases also the biggest case yeah. here <laughs> in Selangor. So uh, now, um, uh, now uh, forestry, I mean forest harvesting, uh, timber uh, is put on moratorium, which means there is no timber production for the state of Selangor, mm -hmm. right? So we have forest area, but they, there's no timber production. So now, uh, they even are... even in even in tree plantations, uh, plantation is a different story. Yeah, that okay. is a plantation. Okay. Yes, okay. Uh, okay. I mean in in natural forests. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So plantation, the yeah. same, the same for Philippines. Yes. Yeah. Right. So now, but other state is still uh they still ongoing. The, the uh, timber production is still going mm -hmm. ongoing. As long as no. So uh, uh, I did a study last year uh, on a piece of land, a piece of forest. Uh, that is a uh, um, 
pit swamp, uh, pit swamp forest, mm -hmm. right? So they need to defend because that piece of land is very uh, interesting to developer. <laughs> so they've been asking to, to convert that land for development. So the forest department came and then said, we don't have bullets to, to, to protect the area. So we need to have some kind of study. So we did scientific study. So um, uh, thank God we managed to get, uh, I think, 10 values, mm -hmm. water catchment, uh, recreation, carbon sequestration, um, I don't remember a few. So, so you can see that, that the forest department are relying on this, this kind of value to, to, to as so-called bullets to, to, you know, to the state government so they can, they can maintain the area. Because the area is very important to provide water for the paddy field next door. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, pit swamp, right? It's like sponge. So it retain water. Right? So uh, they don't have any, uh, so which means they can have paddy production throughout the years. Mm -hmm. So that's one example. Another one is uh, CBA. We use economic evaluation in CBA, uh, cost benefit analysis, to, to, to have a corridor linking uh, fragmented forests. Mm -hmm. We have a CP, CFS, Central Forest Spine, in the center of peninsula, and, but there are also patches of forests. So you need to link, link them so that wildlife can move. That, that's the idea. Lah. So, mm -hmm. uh, so whether it's tangible to do that, then we did uh, a CBA study last, last, last year, yes, yes, also. Right? Um, yeah, so we can see that economic evaluation has been used in, in, uh, in this kind of um, conservation works or, or, or um, by the department. Yeah. So I hope yeah, that's answer. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, we hope that you continue to update us with what's happening over there in Malaysia. Right. So uh, there is a comment here before I call on Doc Annaline. Um, from our former director, uh, Dr. Eleno Peralta, he says that uh, PES could either be voluntary or compulsory. If voluntary, it is easier to implement but may not capture the real cost. If compulsory, it will partake of a uh, user's tax, which, is, which only Congress and perhaps local councils can uh, validly impose. However, a user's tax is more permanent. At any rate, the results of the studies are both indispensable for any PES mechanism to be adopted. Thanks and again, congratulations. So, Doc Anna. Okay, thank you, Atelen. So, um, honestly, uh, uh, working on this project, um, what, uh, this is one of the projects that made me realize how important it is to influence policy with uh, science-based research studies. And um, we should not rest on our laurels and just uh, target like uh, publications and uh, let our research results um, rest on shelves, on bookshelves. So we really have to work aggressively so that our results will reach the, the hands and, and actually the hearts and the minds of our policymakers and even the ordinary people. Uh, because actually I believe that that is our mission. We should design our research studies to uh, solve real life problems and influence um, eventually policies. Um, economic valuation of the value of ecosystem services is actually a concept, an ab a concept that is abstract and it's hard to really grasp, especially if you don't have a technical background on this. And um, apart from doing these research studies, uh, we really have to communicate our results to policymakers and ordinary people. We had this experience in this project when we presented our results to uh, one of the regions attended by the People's Organization and the, and the LGUs. And when we tried to explain them in, in very simple terms how ecosystem services valuation work, uh, I, I believe that there is... Um, uh, there is something uh, that they really understood in that presentation and it actually opened up their, their minds and their eyes that there is value in what they are doing and that value has actually a monetary counterpart. So um, when, we, when, uh, when the ordinary um, uh, uh, people's organization, the, the farmers were able to grasp the value of what they're doing, actually, um, 
they thought that the 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 monetary terms at work we are what that we were talking about are real money. So we actually have to be careful in that. We have to explain that this is just an indication or an estimate of the value. This is not real money that would be exchanged from one hand to another hand. So, uh, but I think that's still important if we are able to communicate clearly and effectively our results to policy and to people without technical background, scientific background on what, what, what we are uh, doing. So um, I think uh, we are on the right track. FDC is on the right track, you know, working aggressively to communicate the results of research studies to influence policy. So um, cheers to more years to FDC. Thank you. Um, I'd like, I saw two raised hands. Uh, may I call on Dean Marlo Mendoza? Dean. Hi, yeah. Again, congratulations to FDC and to our uh, two uh, speakers, no? very knowledgeable. Uh, my question is addressed to uh, Dr. Uh, for a resource person from uh, Malaysia. This is more practical. No? Uh, uh, of course, very, uh, this PES study is very important, but from an operational point of view, you have experience in Malaysia. You have a lot of amenity, you call it amenity forest or protection forest. There are projects inside these forests, say a renewable energy resources. Do you have a policy that says that this company, say a runoff river company, hydropower company, should or is really mandated to contribute some of its uh, revenue or at least uh, approximate the, the value needed to protect that particular resource and contribute that amount? Do you have such a... No? Uh, experience on that, or is it mandated by law? I'm just curious because that's a ready source of uh, funds to finance your protection cost. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, Salamat, Prof. <laughs> thank you for the questions. Uh, wow, that's a tough question from the dean. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, well, um, um, actually, uh, Prof. Um, the the uh, what I can say. Um, in terms of operational, uh, this is my general knowledge. Yeah? Uh, when when a company uh, awarded to 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 uh, for what they call timber extraction, right, for 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 an incoming, they have to pay um, a, a royalty to the state. One royalty. Second is they call CES, C E S S. The C is C E S S CES. We call it CES money is for uh, replanting for 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 uh, what they call for conservation money. Something some related to that. So, which means uh, out of the timber, when they, they when they sell or they produce whatever income from it, they have to pay royalty and cess cess money. So that that, that can be uh, that will be back to the state forestry for for this uh, for the management of the forest lah. So that's one thing. Uh, secondly, I think we have um, under SFM uh, sustainable forest management uh, because we are also comply to this uh, FSC uh, forest stewardship uh, certification. Right, um, where they have to uh, um, have what you call FMU forest management unit. So they have to have replanting, replanting of uh, they have rotational cycle of the compartments, and then you have to have FMU units where they have replanting and also social forestry projects for the locals uh, involved in those areas. So that's my knowledge. Uh, um, yeah, that's what I can understand. Um, another thing is that uh, in Sabah we have um. Uh, parks. Uh, maybe you know about this Sipadan Island. Uh, <laughs> last time we had dispute between the two countries, uh, Philippine Malaysia, to 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 get that island. So this is also one of the parks under uh, we call it Sabah uh, Sabah Park Trust Sabah Parks Trusty Box. Uh, it is something something like a PES like at state level, right? They have a fund, right? This fund comes from all the collection. From all these parks, we have Kinabalu parks, we have several parks in, in Sabah. So this money will be ch channeled into that fund, and this fund is used to manage the area, the areas, but including everything, like salary, promotion, maintenance. So that at state levels, that, that's PES like, right? But if you are looking into specific PES like that, we we yeah, we have discussed this now. I don't think we really have that that uh, really spe specific. Uh, maybe small, small one, that, that, the one that we had in Sabah also, we call a tagal system where the villages are, are allowed to use one stretch of river uh, and then they can block the river. So people have to go through their village and then they have to pay some kind of uh, entrance fee. 
So people will go to the village and they just feed the fish because this fish like uh, so uh, so friendly. <laughs> they go to your feet and you know start cleaning your feet and people enjoy that. You know you can you can touch the fish uh, in natural conditions. So so they have that kind of system. So uh, but the local are, are not allowed to go and catch the fish. So these are some example that we had. Uh, from. So I hope I answered the question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, very much. Yeah. Right. Thank you Dean. <laughs> right. Okay, um, let's call for the last question or comment. Uh, our former director, Dr. Tony Balangge, who will be also presenting a paper in the next uh, webinar of FBC. Sir? Thank you, Len Len. Yes, uh, congratulations to the presenters, to the FBC and uh, the Dean, and of course to the beautiful MC. I have some uh, questions for Dr. Kudelian. I don't know if you have read them already in the chat. I place it in the chat. Uh, do I have to read them, uh, doctor? Um, no need. No need, doc. Can, na, okay. they, they were able to read it and we have three, okay. min three minutes <laughs> okay, before one minute, closing. One okay. minute for it. Uh, no. Okay. Okay. Can I answer it, sir? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Of course. Uh, yeah, so um, Dr. Balangge was asking if we're able to um, uh, include the, the effect of the pandemic, especially on the tourist survey. So, sir, when we can, it, the, the survey was conducted in 2019, so there is no pandemic yet. So we were not able to. But, but the, your NPB projection is up to 2027. So at least you should have considered it. Yeah, but it will change your NPB, right? <laughs> yeah, sir. But when we did the, the, the analysis, sir, there's no pandemic yet so we were not able to do it in the projection so maybe sir if we have a like an extension <laughs> or a new project on this we, we can make some new um, adjustments and calculations yeah and i suggest i suggest that uh, should be included in the no, in the analysis yes sir okay and as for the water sir so um the results show a a, a declining um amount in the water production so when we um studied it and analyzed our data. So it's uh, really because of the, um, the land use change and also the declining rainfall amount that was projected for the time period. Oh, okay, were well, you able to you know, distinguish which uh, of these factors uh, contributed significantly to the reduction? Oh, sir, we were not able to do that, sir, because um, uh, we only use invest. So in invest, there's a water balance um, equation, sir. But uh, regarding uh, the analysis of the most um, significant factor, we're not able to do that. Okay. Uh, regarding that uh, uh, framework you were mentioning a while ago about the PS, PS application, there is a, an executive order. Uh, I'm not sure if the number is correct. It's 389 or 398. All the conservation financing mechanisms were defined in that uh, executive order. So this will serve as your uh, legal framework. Oh, I, I just don't know whether they have already uh, drafted an, a, uh, what do you call this, an IRR for the implementation yeah. of that you know, executive order. Yeah, thank you, Doc. Uh, to yeah. me, thank you very we much. Will, yeah, we will check on that and uh, look into other um, activities or initiatives for this. And just an update from uh, Forrester Vener Garcia from DNR. He says that the DNR has already organized a TWG, Technical Working Group, to work on the institu institutionalization of natural capital accounting and is in the process of crafting a department administrative order on the matter. So we'll end with that. And I would like to... Um, give the floor back to Hanna for the uh, awarding of certificates of appreciation. Please don't close your cameras, uh, speakers. Okay, so again, we would like to express our sincere thank you to our speakers for sharing their valuable knowledge and time for this policy webinar. So now let me read the citation for the certificate. Okay, so this certificate of appreciation is given to Annalyn El Codelan for serving as speaker in the policy forum, linking science and policy evaluation of ecosystem services for policy, the Philippine and Malaysia cases, held this 4th of August, 2021, 
organized by the Forestry Development Center through the UPLB Foundation Incorporated in line with the celebration of its 43rd anniversary and in partnership with the Forest Management Bureau for the implementation of the Save Our Watershed campaign with support from the Information Technology Center, UPLB, by a Zoom webinar. Given this fourth day of August 2021, signed Marshall C. Amaro Jr., CESO 3, Assistant Secretary for Policy, Planning, and Foreign Assisted and Special Projects, and Directors in Concurrent Capacity. Marlo D. Mendoza, Dean, College of Forestry and Natural Resources, UPLB College, Laguna, and Priscilla C. Dalom, Director, Forestry Development Center, UPLB College of Forestry and Natural Resources, College, Laguna. Now for the certificate, let me also read the certificate of appreciation is given to Samsul Herman bin Muhammad Afandi for serving as speaker in the policy forum, linking science and policy evaluation of ecosystem services for policy, the Philippine and Malaysian cases held this 4th August 2021, organized by the Forestry Development Center through the UPLB Foundation Incorporated in line with the celebration of its 43rd anniversary and in partnership with Forest Management Bureau for the implementation of the Save Our Watershed campaign with support from the Information Technology Center, UPLB by Zoom webinar. Given this fourth day of August 2021, signed Marshall C. Amaro Jr., CESO 3, Assistant Secretary for Policy, Planning, and Foreign Assisted and Special Projects and Director in Concurrent Capacity, Marlo D. Mendoza, Dean College of Forestry and Natural Resources, UPLB College, Laguna, and Priscilla C. Dolom, Director, Forestry Development Center, UPLB CFNR College, Laguna. So again, we would like to uh, thank, thank our speakers for this activity. So thank you Paul for gracing our activity. And also to acknowledge also some of our guests. I would like to acknowledge our former director who is present today, Dr. Lucrecia Rebuio, Dr. Tony Balangue, Attorney Eleno Peralta, Dr. Renato Lapitan, and also on behalf of Dr. Antonio Carandang, Dr. Mirna Carandang. And now to give us a closing remarks, may I call on our director, Dr. Priscilla C. Dolong. Thank you, Hannah. I take this opportunity to, talk, to thank all of you for attending and participating in the celebration of 43rd year anniversary and to our forest policy talks with the team linking science and policy in forestry. I would like to express our gratitude to our partner, the Save Our Watershed Program of the Forest Land Management Project of the Forest Management UODNR for, for providing assistance in the conduct of this webinar on valuation of watershed ecosystem services for policy, the Philippine and Malaysian cases. To our speakers and guests, I would like to thank Chancellor Jose B. Camacho Jr. for his message, Dean Marlo Mendoza for a warm welcome remarks, ASEC Marshall Amaro Jr. for his opening remarks, the former FBC directors for sharing their experiences and expectations from FBC, and to our main speakers, Dr. Annalyn Codilan, Associate Professor and Associate Dean of the College of Policy and Natural Resources, UPLB, and Dr. Shamsud, Associate Professor of the School of Business and Economics, University, Putra, Malaysia. Dr. Annalyn Kodilan presented to us valuing watershed ecosystem services in FMP sites, in uh, valuing ecosystem services in forest land management project sites in the Philippines, policy implications. This is based on a study conducted by the FDC on valuation of watershed ecosystem services in FMP sites in the, 12, in the 25 subwatersheds in regions two, three, six, and CAR. 
Dr. Tukadilan discussed to us the framework of this study and its limitations. They identified priority ecosystem services by the stakeholders, such as water, soil erosion control, carbon storage, and sequestration and recreation. The evaluation tools used were the following depending on the ecosystem services, invest method, contingent valuation method, or the willingness to pay, cost-based approach, and replacement method. In the valuation study, two scenarios were used, the current, which is from 2018 to 2022, and the projected scenario, which is from 2023 to 2027, and the business as usual as compared with the development scenario. Based on the results of the valuation study of the five ecosystem services, policy implications and recommendations were cited. Operational and policy recommendations as well as general recommendations were, were provided. Some of the policy recommendations, some of the policy recommendations are integration of the research results in various management plans such as CLUP, FLUP, integrated watershed management plan, among others. Conduct of water studies on the valuation of the identified ecosystem services in other sub-watershed studied and in other subwater set. And the result of this study can be used as input in the formulation of the national guidelines for the implementation of payment for environmental services. On the presentation of our second speaker, Dr. Shamsun from Malaysia, he presented to us the payment for ecosystem services for ecotourism, sharing the initiatives and practices at recreational natural resources in Malaysia. He discussed to us the forestry in Malaysian government, which has three levels, the facts and figures of forestry in Peninsular Malaysia, as well as the constitutional provision, policy and legislation of forestry in Malaysia. According to him, they have a national forest policy of the permanent forest states, which has four major functions, namely protection forest, production forest, amenity forest, and the research and education forest. This research project on recreation and ecotourism is in the amenity forest, which is the major services provided by the forestry department in promoting the forest beyond timber with emphasis on ecosystem services and non-extractive. In the amenity forest, according to him, they have 128 forest eco park in Malaysia. This study were conducted in the three forest eco park in Peninsular Malaysia. We presented to us the description and overview of the three forest eco park with very nice pictures, the framework of the project with three components, the seller, the buyer, and the GIS, which provide the layout of the natural recreational resources. On his discussion of the PAS mechanism, he mentioned that they conducted contingent valuation method and the choice of experiments on local communities and business sectors. A focus group discussion was also conducted to verify and determine the PES mechanism. The proposed PES mechanism has three categories. According to him, they have the buyer, the payment mechanism, and the seller. The buyer is the tourist, the payment mechanism is through tickets, and the seller is the district forestry department. He further discussed the recreation and ecotourism services policy for PAS, such as monitoring, reporting, and accreditation, which will be done periodically and with specific activities. The way forward based on the result of the project, they are proposing to amend the law to have ecosystem services charged, because according to Dr. Shamsul, the present law did not allow ecosystem services to be charged. There is a need to amend the law to have a power source for ecosystem services. According to him also, more collaborations is still needed with for state forestry department at present. The topics discussed by our speakers were further enhanced and clarified during the open forum. Some questions were answered fully and issues concerns were addressed by these speakers. 
Since the FDC's forest policy ethos team is linking science and policy, the papers presented by our speakers are very timely, considering that there is a need to formulate policies on PAS based on academic research. As Chancellor Camacho said, the best uses of research is to serve as basis for the creation of a policy. In this case, policy that can be used for the sustainable use and preservation of the forests of the two countries, the Philippines and Malaysia. We, have the, we hope that our discussion provides us with relevant information on valuation of watershed ecosystem services for policy, the Philippine and Malaysian cases. In behalf of the FDC and FMB, I would like to thank everyone for attending and actively participating via Zoom and Facebook Live in this very important event, the FDC's Forest Policy Ethos Watershed Management Webinar Series in support the Forest Lands Management Project Save Our Watershed Campaign. Lastly, before we forget, I would like to thank Centro Santa Cruz and the Ecosystems Research and Development Bureau for the seedlings they have given to FTC for our tree planting activity. In closing, let me leave you with a quotation by Ronald Reagan that says, I believe in a sound and strong environmental policy that protects the health of our people and a wise stewardship of our nation's natural resources. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you, Dr. Delong. And before we close our program, um, let me ask uh, Dr. Kadilan and Dr. Shamso, can you please open your video for picture taking? I forgot to announce the picture taking with our speakers. And also, Dr. Len Bugayon, thank you for being our moderator for our formal policy webinar. Dr. Dr. Anna. And uh, let's also ask everyone to open their cameras for a uh, group photo. Ah, okay, so uh, for the group photo na po ito? Yes. So let's one photo shoot na lang po pala. Okay, please kindly open your video cam. Okay, ready? So I'll count to three. One, two, three, smile. Yes, another one. Okay, another shot po. One, two, three, smile. Happy anniversary, FDC. Okay, so thank you so much for our, to our guests, our speakers, and our participants. So some announcement po. Okay, for announcement. For the, for the recording of this particular webinar, you can kindly uh, follow us through UPLB Forestry Development Center to FD and also our YouTube channel, UPLB Forestry Development Center, as well as the UPLB CFNR channel. We will post the video there so you can uh, watch it for your uh, purpose. And now for our next uh, announcement, uh, to our upcoming FDC Policy E-Talks Watershed Management Webinar Series in support of the Forest Land Management Project Save Our Watershed Campaign this coming September to November. So kindly visit our FDC FB page for more details. So for our next FDC Policy E-Talks Webinar Series 2021, we will have a uh, a seminar entitled Enhancing Wealth Creation from the Forest Land Ecosystem Policy Implication, which is scheduled on August 10. That is next Tuesday by uh, Zoom also. So you can register now using this link or you can visit the FDC FB page. So there's the link, uh, website link option that you could already register after this webinar. Okay, so for our post -evalu evaluation form, kindly accomplish our post evaluation form through this link or scan the code. And we would like to remind everyone that no evaluation, no certificate will be issued. So again, 
Uh, we would like to acknowledge our sponsor for this policy webinar, the Forest Land Management Project of DNR, Centro Santa Cruz, ERDB, and also the ITC UPLB. Okay, so thank you once again to our guests, speakers, and participants for allotting our time in attending this webinar and celebrating with us our, our anniversary. Have a blessed day, everyone, and God bless. Again, this is Sana Kapintin signing off.